I hope you... <laughs> What's oh, up? Shit. <laughs> Everything okay? What happened? There was a gust of wind and almost knocked my fan off the window, and I just caught it with one hand. That's as a it strong fell. gust of wind, man. Right? Jesus. Yeah. Well, it was kind of laying like this up against the window. Hmm. Welcome to the Roundtable Podcast. Hi there. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. It's uh, well, you you don't know this, but it's been a long time since we all we've all been together. We're you yeah, know, casting the shroud of illusion upon your faces as to like the release schedule of things. But uh, oh. well, first of all, I changed equipment, and you can probably tell now. But it's uh, it's a whole new universe that we're all living in, and uh, we're glad you can By still you be a all, part of it. You mean you? Yeah. Well. The all right, the, the more money you put in, the more mic equipment there is. Eventually, there's going to be no bear left. <laughs> All the Patreon account just dumps into my hardware fund. Uh, I'm Bear Taffy. I'm here with Mathis Games. Hello. Who's on a coffee run. I was yeah. on a coffee Did run. Did you bring some for the now. class? Here you go. I have some mm. heavenly donuts. What the heck is... That's not coffee. That's donut that's coffee? Ice coffee. Ice that's coffee. A, that's <laughs> a 2% milk in a big cup. It's you just made regular a, cream and sugar. <clears throat> you broke up a powdered and donut and you like blended it with <laughs> yeah. the coffee they serve. I you. don't drink iced coffee black. I don't like the taste of iced coffee black. So iced coffee I have with cream and sugar. All right. I like my, like my coffee black just like my metal. You almost got that, that out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rockley you sound like me. Here. <sighs> hi, hi Rockley Smile. Hi. Hey. Also, Northern Lion. When you order iced coffee from McDonald's, oh, and I think the coffee there is actually pretty good, is but it? they default to putting cream and sweetener in the iced coffee, which is fine if you want to have cream and sweetener in the iced coffee. That makes sense. But why is the default when I order an iced coffee, iced coffee plus like cream and sweetener? That's weird that they don't ask. It's something you should add on the end. Hey, can I have an iced coffee with cream and sweetener? Otherwise, just give me the basic thing. When you go to McDonald's for a coffee, they're just kind of assuming that you, you need that flavor in your mouth. That's what people go there for. I guess it is. It's like, you know, this is a legal narcotic, so we're going to jazz it up as much as we can. But, <laughs> like, it annoys me. every. I always forget. Like, it comes out, and then I take a sip, and I'm like, ah, shit. Again. <laughs> I did it again. They got me again. God, no, yeah. They don't ever ask, like, how do you want that? No, no, That's it's really all about weird. At Dunkin' Donuts, they ask everything. I was going to say that, yeah. Dunkin' Donuts, they have the default, the black coffee. You have to you have to order specifically. I want the coffee with the sweetener, with the cream yeah. and sugar, and that kind of thing. They have they multiple have milk choices for you if you want. Yeah, it's crazy. In general, I think it's better to give it black, and then if you take a sip and you think it's gross, you can be like, oh, can you put like you know a shot of sweetener into that or something like that, and then it'll be okay. Once the sweetener's in there, I don't know if you got like a, a freaking stoichiometric setup back there that you can get the sweetener out of it. Well, do you ask, like, if you say, I want my coffee regular, what does that mean to, to you Canadians? If I... If Actually, I went into McDonald's and I said all of the regular coffee, I think they would just be like, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> like, all right. And like, wow. around here, like a large iced coffee regular means four sweeteners, four sh creams. What the no, hell? It doesn't. No that is exactly way. That's incorrect. I, I worked at Dunkin' Donuts, motherfucker, and in a medium, you get four, four and three. No, that's objectively wrong. They're misusing you, the terminology. When you, someone says regular, at least at Dunkin' Donuts and the places I go to, medium is three, large is four, small is two. That is how much you get. You're out of so your goddamn and mind. the other one is zero. And if you want there one, is no zero. You yourself. ask for black if you get zero. <clears throat> oh. In Canada, there is a, there's a Canadianism called the double-double, which is you go to, like, Tim Hortons, get a double-double, it's two cream, two sugar. Double-double is eight, eight, eight in a large ice and a fucking Dunkin' Donuts. At least in the northeast of America, at the very least. Maybe it's different in other parts. Their so coffee I... is whiter than milk or cream. <laughs> How does this happen? Donut smoothie, yeah. man. <laughs> if I go, yeah, if I go and I order a sweetened, like, so if the regular is four, I don't even know what you're measuring, four units of sweetened. Four uh, spoons, like uh, teaspoons. Uh, four scoops. jiggers. They okay. Get the and, uh, and then they have the, they have an automated machine for cream and milk and stuff. And you just hit large and it just one, two, three, four. So I, I would just get, like, a cup of sugar, right? They would hand me that. Yeah. I would get four coffee. shots of insulin afterwards. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, anyway, this is the uh, Roundtable Coffee podcast. Uh, we're going to talk about some games, though, to try to switch it up a little bit. Lame. Today's docket, we're going to be discussing the new Assassin's Creed game. I wonder how many times that sentence is going to come out of my mouth over, like, the next eight months of doing this podcast. <laughs> At least four times in the next six. Mm-hmm. 
Assassin's Creed Syndicate was uh, just announced. We're going to be talking about the uh, very interesting issue between Green Man Gaming and CD Projekt Red regarding codes for The Witcher 3, which we all thought is pretty me. interesting. CD Projekt. Projekt. Oh, Projekt. 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 My bad. Oh, wow, you guys are being so racist. That's Polish pronunciation. That's, not... <laughs> that's, that's, that's their that name, is... Mathis. <laughs> well, right, right. Sorry, you're right. I had a, Why don't uh, you go to Warsaw and say it to their face? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can end that there. Uh, World of Warcraft <laughs> lost 3 million subscribers as uh, Blizzard is going in a new direction. We want to talk about uh, MMOs in general, the, uh, the position they have in the industry at the, at the moment. Uh, also going to be talking about Action Hank. It's Hank. It's not Hank. It's, it's not Hank. Hank. It's Hank. Hank's mm-hmm. not, it's not Hank. It's not Hank, guys. Rhymes with Spank and Bank. Mm-hmm. Rhymes with Platinum Grammy Award winning recording artist Pink. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pink. <laughs> That'll be on the new Guitar Hero. Yeah. Pink's song, Don't Hit Me. <laughs> and then, uh. <laughs> <laughs> this has to stop. Why would she have a song called Don't Hit Me? <laughs> it's a cry for help. <laughs> and uh, Invisible Ink is going to be our other uh, game discussion for today. But to open it up, we do want to discuss the uh, the new set list that's been announced for Guitar Hero Live, which is underwhelming, I would say. I would agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would agree. Well, there about a third or so of them had been in previous Guitar mm-hmm. Heroes. Let's start with some highlights. Mm-hmm. Yeah, What's everybody awesome. excited to play in guitar? Yeah, well, All right. On hand. Uh, I can Google it. Pierce the Veil, King for a Day. That's one I, I think that I'd like to play. A little excited about that, yeah. I did not expect that in there. I'm a little disappointed that it seems like of what we're seeing here, we're going to be subjected to a lot of what we hear on the radio every day in like the top 40 set lists. Not even necessarily that, but like the alternative stations, what they're playing every single day. I, You know, like... I I guess it's kind of not realistic to expect to hear the deep cuts on Guitar Hero games, especially now that this is sort of the resurgence of the genre. I suppose it it should be expected that they're going to go the route of songs that everyone knows and wants to play. Because it's supposed to be a party game for people that don't really like to play video games. So mm-hmm. that makes sense overall. But yeah, that's why you see stuff like the Black Keys go on the ceiling, uh, the Lumineers, Ho Hey. I don't think that's going to be fun to play at all because it's I don't very. Think a lot of these songs are going to be fun to play. No, yeah, like stuff like, yeah, the Lumineers song, The Killers When You Were Young, which Ryan made this joke earlier, but like, yeah, thanks, thank you for the eighth iteration of that <laughs> in the rhythm games. <laughs> uh, Fallout Boy, that one actually might be pretty fun. My songs know what you did in the dark. That one might be pretty good. And then, you know, System of Down Chop Suey is going to be fun as well. But it's all stuff that we've, you know... I think been... I had Chop Suey already. Yeah, Wasn't yeah, that... yeah. You know, Chop, Chop Suey, I think, was in... Was it Rock it might Moon? have been DLC, yeah, I think. I think it was DLC, yeah. Well, I remember yeah, it again... being really hard, actually. Was it? Like, I was surprised by how difficult it was, which I didn't expect, because it's a pretty simple song. Mm-hmm. We got Ballroom Blitz on here somewhere? That's missing. Well, like, look at the tops. <laughs> look, Judas Priest, Breaking the Law, Pantera, Cowboys from Hell, Alter Bridge, Cry of Achilles... Uh, Rage Against the Machine, Gorilla Radio, come on. Mm. Uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Higher Ground, and then Chop Suey. It's like all of those songs. I, was, I think I've seen already. I was waiting for the day we was going to get some Alter Bridge up in here, man. Oh, like, that's know. exciting. I'm, I don't know. Like I know we talked about this before we started the podcast, but super stoked for Skrillex Bangerang. Mm-hmm. <laughs> really? Dude, when I, when I, I think, think being a rock and up. roll hero on stage, <laughs> I think... I want to be like Skrillex. Dude, I'm not the biggest Skrillex fan, but I could totally see that being like uh, the song where everybody, like all the dudes in the basement are like, oh yeah, this fucking Bangarang. Let's put Bangarang on there as a joke. But really the guy's like, I'm stoked to play Bangarang. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. I had a couple songs like that in Rock Band. You'd be like, yeah, put this one on as a joke, please. Mm. You'd be like, I love this song. What if it's like Visions or whatever, where it's just impossibly hard and everybody loves it because of that? Dude, I forgot about Visions. Holy shit. Visions did, was... did anybody actually love Visions? No. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. in, in theory, like the construction of that song was ridiculous. It's possible. It was just boom, 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 boom. Yeah, what, you know, are you guys looking know. at the, the song list on the actual website or elsewhere? The one um, I elsewhere. I, I I'm watching one on the actual you. website, and the crowd in the background keeps waving at me, and it's creepy. Madness! They're cheering at me, <laughs> and then and then it, it then Go it does back the to the fold. and then it does that obvious like <laughs> kind of like loop where everything like freezes for a second, and then it starts again. 
that's just the glitch in the matrix they're trying to get you to come back and plug into the system right. again what yep. i mean Bye. for me it's like i guess maybe this is appealing to a slightly more contemporary audience but like like nick was saying like paint it black that was already in guitar hero 3 i think it yeah. was a cover but it was in guitar hero 3 yeah. and then when you were young has been in everything and you know breaking the law is kind of cool i can't remember if breaking the law was in it but i had um the whole Screaming for Vengeance, Judas Priest album and Rock Band, that was a lot of fun, but I'm kind of like, I'm over it. Like, it, I, they didn't, those games didn't mine that much content. Rock Band did with its DLC, but like, yeah. the track list that was on the disc, there was always like a huge overlap. So to see When You Were Young again, and Pain in Black again, it's kind of just like... And the Killers have had yeah. several, <laughs> like, breakout mm -hmm. smash yeah. hits since that song came out. Yeah, that song was, like, 2006. Else. Yeah, Anything like that. else from Sam's Town I would have been happy with because I love that whole album. Yeah. They could have just put other They're songs. a good band. I don't want to rip on the Killers because I like the Killers. It's just like, fucking stop playing when, when you were young. <laughs> when you were young and Welcome Home, the only two yeah. songs that anyone would ever play online. It's just like, we have literally hundreds of songs to play and that's still what shows and hopefully us. We, i mean and again hopefully this is just the initial like 24 songs and it'll be you know they'll add more as time goes on but it just for an initial like bam this is what you're getting it's like well, what yeah, if this is the whole set this? list if this is the yeah. set list i will never i won't buy this game I hope Rock well, Band will be better. No, it's not going to be the whole set. No, there's no way. Set. Keep in mind, though, guys, that, that they've changed the guitar construction, right? So there's the two sets of buttons. This yep. will at least give us something fresh to do with these songs we've already played a hundred times. I mean, that's true, but it's still the same fucking song. Um, I know. Just saying. No, that's a valid just, point, actually, because that does, you know... That I I can see that argument. The right through. I can see that argument being made internally of well yeah they played the song already but we've got this whole new way to do it and you know like you can make chords and shit now and no, I'm just trying to paint a good picture on it I'm still pissed off. It's not that I'm sick of like playing these songs I'm just kind of sick of hearing them like I could go the rest of my life without hearing Paint It Black again. Mm -hmm. I used to like Paint It Black I was like it's a pretty dope song I played yeah. it like a hundred times in Guitar Hero three and I'm like I don't really need to play Dude. Paint It Black again. It's it started when Twisted Metal Black used it a bunch of times in their promotions, and then they picked yep. it up, so it was just like this deluge of that song for like five years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is like the one game where I exclusively want fan service all the time. And maybe it's just me, but I'm looking through it, and I'm like, I don't really, I'm not that interested. I want to see more more classic rock, basically. That's yes. why I play rock band. Is Right, exactly. It's, it's about living out your rock star dreams, not your Skrillex dreams. Look at these old men. Oh, <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, like, Guitar Hero 1, when it initially came out, was what really put me on the path to loving classic rock. I wasn't a huge classic rock fan until Guitar Hero 1, and I really started liking a lot, like, uh, a lot of the different songs and bands there, and that's what turned me on to classic rock, and now that seems like they're trying to go away from that. Again, I feel like Skrillex would do better on DJ Hero, which is a dead franchise now, obviously. Yeah. Tell um, me when this... they put Guitar Hero Led Zeppelin <laughs> back on display. Please do. Give me some Led Zeppelin. I'd be so happy with that. Give me some Boston. I, yeah. I can get down with Boston. Boston was always our, uh, that was yes. our finale song whenever we mm -hmm. play as a family. Always got to be Boston. It's like Boston, The Police, Rush. Queen. Mm. It's true. David Bowie. Like, I, I don't want to be like that old man, but I, are, is anybody excited about this? Or is it just because the games industry, like pseudo journalists like ourselves are all like mid twenties and up men who are like, you know, <laughs> what do I care about Skrillex being in this game? Blah, blah, blah. Maybe like the people at large are actually like, you know, this is a pretty good track list. It's possible. We got know. our finger on the pulse of the nation here, don't we? I think we can adequately represent yeah. the interests of those who may be, you know, clamoring for a resurgence of the Guitar Hero franchise. May, both, I don't know just more Rush. Just add, like, more Rush. Mm -hmm. This is a whole Rush album in there. Just let me play as Neil Peart, and that way <laughs> everyone's happy. What but, if they did an alternate model where instead of just buying this setup, like you could buy this whole set of all these songs, or you can buy for $20 the starter edition, and then you can buy, like, three albums... Of your choosing. Oh, don't tell him to do that, though. I no, it's just you, an dude. option. Dude, that, that for sounds $60, so... For $60, you get three albums that you already know you like. It sounds so clean and pure in the way you're presenting uh. it. There's just... <laughs> demons will grab right, I'm hold. sorry. It was just an idea. Never mind. Pretend I never said it. <laughs> Man, remember when the uh. rock band released all of Doolittle by the Pixies? Those did they do no. that? They did do that, <laughs> wow. yeah. 
I know the Rock Band Network just had some stuff that you never even thought you'd want to play, and then you download it, and it turns out you were right. But they, <laughs> they went overboard, man. Like, they got all kinds of stuff on there. So that's maybe kind of uh, the... I think that's kind of like the onus of let's just do a bunch of stuff that's come out recently that people will recognize and want to play in the Guitar Hero game. Yeah. Which... It, let's be honest, is driving the majority of like the funding behind the resurgence. I mean, we were talking about it last time. When you get people like Pete Wentz to show up for a release party mm -hmm. at a Best Buy in New York City, you're going for the <laughs> a different crowd. You're going for how old we were when we were first playing the Guitar Hero games. Like that's yeah. more or less how they've had to shift the focus. And I think those people want to play Bangarang <laughs> and just have one person press the space bar at the beginning of the song, and then they all just party and do cocaine. <laughs> like, that's what playing Bangarang is. That, is that what this is like, going yeah. for now? That's, this, is that's, for, that's Guitar Hero? this is for 19-year-olds who play Bangarang in their college dorm, and then are like, man, this song reminds me so much of three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it really exactly. takes me back. Right. Remember those yeah. high school days? <laughs> man, when... When you were young, that song came out when I was like... When I was I young. Was in middle school, man. <laughs> so long ago. That song's oh, about me, was... man. I was young when this <laughs> came out. I think oh. it's fair to say that... Well, I, I won't speak for you guys, but I think to some extent it's fair to say that we have kind of like a pro-rock band stance relative to the Guitar Hero stuff. Yeah. But I will say that I think rock... Or not rock band specifically, but harmonics, I think is a little bit more like committed to that kind of music... Mindset, they're like music first. Yeah. I would expect to see a more impressive track list, unless literally the reason the track list is kind of underwhelming is because they're contacting bands and they're like, you know, we don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I would, I'd like to see the, the track list from Rock Band 4. I hope it's not just like largely overlapped. Yeah. yeah, fingers crossed. Although I will say with Rock Band 4, if they brought some stuff back from the previous Rock Band games, including stuff that was released as DLC, I'd be like, yeah, I could be into it depending on what it is. I don't no, want to play, I think I'm paranoid again. But <laughs> A lot of these songs are probably the songs they are because of the ease of negotiating the rights management for them. Mm. Considering how much negotiation, how much money the legal department probably has to put in, this is like the most efficient way to get their money back is to use songs they already have an agreement with. That's true. They not. I mean, they might not necessarily be forking over extra money that way, but I don't know. It's just it's it just doesn't tickle me. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a lawyer either, so it's just my guess. You're not. It's, it's a good guess. No? Oh man, I wish I was. It would be really handy for a lot of these discussions. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be you have great insight into a lot of the things yeah. we talk about ignorantly. No, I'll just pretend I am and speculate. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Guitar Hero Live is going to be coming on later this year. Uh, we're, you know, this, again, we are joking about this being the whole set list. I'm sure they'll be releasing more and more as the as the days go on. Apparently, oh, there is a Sleigh Bell song in here. I was going to mm -hmm. say, they're showing some artists. But yeah, anyway. Some, some Christmas songs. Yo, of <laughs> all the Red Hot Chili Peppers discography, why higher ground again? <laughs> Like, I don't even like the Red Hot Chili Peppers that much, but the songs that they've had in those games have been fun to play. But I don't want to play Higher Ground again. They have at least 20 songs that have been in the top five of the charts by themselves. Yeah. Like, they've got a lot there of options there. Line. There's tons of options. I yeah. think in there, there's only been Give It Away, Higher Ground, and uh, Danny California. And they had there's Snow so much DLC. More. Oh, they did, they mm -hmm. did. Um, there's so much more to draw from there than just mm -hmm. those, like, four songs. Oh, well. But not oh. if they already have the rights to it and don't have to pay any extra for it. I guess. I, well, I, Higher Ground is weird because that was a cover in Guitar Hero 1. True. I really am curious how much of a factor that's playing. Cause... Well, I mean, like, I wonder if, if a lot of their thought process is, look, this is not, we're not sure this is going to do well because we killed the fucking yeah. franchise. I hope they're, they're not, like, like approaching risk. new right. bands with that mentality. <laughs> like, <laughs> listen, I, we don't know if this is going to sell, but... You wanna maybe try it? Yeah, but I mean, I feel like that might be part of it. Like they don't know how well it's gonna take off. Um, it, I mean, they when Guitar Hero ended, people were like, "I'm so sick of Guitar Hero at this point." So maybe they don't want to put in a ton of money right away, see how it's gonna do. If it explodes again, then maybe DLC or the next one will be like all new stuff that they forked out a ton of cash for. Mm. And so it's something like, like Nick was saying a minute ago. It's kind of that idea that. They don't want to maybe take the risk. There you go, you know, sip on that milk. 
Mm-hmm. I don't want to like make this go on that much further, but there was uh, IGN had uh, Rock Band Four as like its game of the month, so they were doing a bunch of exclusive reveals and stuff like that. And there's some cool stuff seemingly coming in Rock Band Four. Like one of the things that I latched onto is they're changing singing, so it's not actually just entirely note matching. But as long as you're actually in tune, you can kind of like embellish and I don't want to say freestyle, but like improvise a little bit, so you're not just doing like a carbon copy of the original source track. Mm-hmm. That's a good idea. Mm-hmm. It's smart. Cool. I like it. And no more custom fills, which I, in a way I'm kind of disappointed with, but there was always that guy who whenever there was a custom fill for Star Power would just be like, da 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 <laughs> doom And then everyone would like lose their rhythm and be like, come on, Jerry, come on. <laughs> So, now, now for Star Power, like all the fills are gonna be from like this pool of fills that match the style and the the tempo okay. of the the song, and then you'll just not insert that. Wild is bazzing. Well, yeah. there was either that or the person that had no fucking idea what was happening when that came across. They just freeze up and like, yeah. what? What? I and... feel like the, uh, the the when the singing Star Power happened, people would just be like, ah. Yeah. Well, had to do in that the middle of a Simon and Garfunkel song. <laughs> sometimes it wouldn't actually recognize it unless you shouted. Yeah. So you'd, yeah, you'd be like, you know, tangled up in blue. Tangled up in blue. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> it's a really bad time to do that because then there's like 16 bars with no singing. <laughs> you go, you go oh, there. yeah! Tangled <laughs> up! <laughs> Guys, do we, do we know if the rock band guitar is going to be the same as the old one or are they also going... The new Guitar Hero route. I think they said that all of the old stuff was going to be compatible with the new Rock Band okay. game. I don't so want to be quoted that. on that, but I am fairly certain that I read it. Yeah, that's kind of why I'm asking, because I'd really love to keep my DLC. I know they said they wanted to do that. What was your your all favorite uh, guitar peripheral from those that, that era? I really liked the Guitar Hero 2 guitar. The yeah, flying that's, uh, three. Yeah. The Guitar Hero 3 Les Paul for me. I was a guitar hero too, guy. Mm-hmm. I really liked the uh, the Stratocaster. Was that Rock Band one? That was the Rock Band original one. Yeah. Was that the? Did it have the tapping ones on the top of the fret? Oh the, yeah, that was. That might have been two. I can't remember. Was, was that two? Tapping? That might have been two. Yeah, they had a, They had the you mean original. The, slide the touch screen or touch pad? No, no, that uh-huh. was a guitar hero guitar. The the Rock Band Strat, they had the five finger buttons up where oh, they normally are on the neck yeah. and then they had five additional ones down you didn't lower have to on the neck. That was the original mm-hmm. set, I believe. I really like that. That was ridiculous. Yeah, actually, now that I think about it, I think I was a Les Paul guy too with the Guitar Hero 3 guitar. Yeah, that, that was, was a good one. That was a really good one. Very comfy. That, mm-hmm. Yeah. Let us know what your allegiances are. <laughs> whether they be to Guitar Hero peripherals or... Rockman games, or you know, any combination of those two things. Assassin's Creed Syndicate is coming out October twenty fourth of this year, and mm-hmm. uh, I think we're all just honestly shocked. I mean, <laughs> I think Ubisoft came out and said, "Thank you so much for beta testing our game with Assassin's Creed Unity." Here's oh, the actual man. working version. Oh no. I'm so Mathis. sick of fucking Assassin's Creed. <laughs> I'm so sick of those games. I want like, you to it's tell... going to be so new. And then the combat's clunky. It's shitty. And all the gameplay is like, look at all the stealth shit you're going to do. And nobody does stealth because stealth is shit in that game. I'm so, it's the same fucking thing every year. But everybody's like, every time it gets announced, I look at Twitter and everybody's like, it looks so good. People. It I mean, does not good. Learn. Every time it looks good. Let's Let's be honest about that too. It's like, they do a good job of, being I able disagree. to resell you on Assassin's Creed games because they make. I just I remember in the fucking pre-alpha gameplay thing they released today. It's like now we're gonna go into stealth mode. Take off the top hat mm. and he crouches. <laughs> and I'm like, he pulled hat. his hoodie up though, man. That's true. <laughs> he thing, pulled up the hood. The thing with Assassin's Creed is that it it works kind of like the Sonic cycle, but every year and a half, two years, there's actually like a really good Assassin's Creed game that I think keeps pushing the momentum. So mm-hmm. it's not exactly people being like, well, it's I really like Sonic up. Adventure 2 13 years ago. <laughs> it's like Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag was people being like, oh, it stumbled in Assassin's Creed 3, but this is amazing. Like people well, love the Assassin's things Creed I remember 4. reading about Black Flag was like everything the pirate parts are great. Just take out the Assassin's Creed bits. <laughs> and then they were just like, no more pirate stuff, back to Assassin's Creed. And no, I was like, okay, That's so not like what we wanted. when Assassin's Creed 3 rolled around, it was not my favorite, but the boat missions were 
totally new and i was like yep. this is great i love this part of this game why we should make a game based around this and then they heard me because they wiretapped my house after <laughs> i signed away my soul to ubisoft <laughs> and assassin's creed 4 was terrific i loved black flag i played the whole thing it was like one of my favorite games that year people wanted a full-on pirate game after that mm -hmm. they made because that though they made rogue the, i didn't play Rogue. Yeah, that was another one what happened with rogue that Rogue was a, a last-gen game. Yeah, it was last-gen, and then eventually came out on PC like six months later. But it was after like the ill will from Unity had kind of boiled to the surface, so I don't think it made a big splash. Huh? Did you play Rogue? No, I didn't play Rogue, no. Well, was I it another it was okay. like, Black Flag like piracy game? Is that what it was? Because now I might check it out, because if it's like another pirate game, I'll go fucking play it. As I understand it, it was kind of like... Bar. Because I'm pretty sure what it is is that they came out with like Assassin's Creed 4 and they're like, oh shit, people really love this boat stuff, but we're like 80% of the way done Assassin's Creed <laughs> Unity. So we can't just like, we can't steer into that. So they're like, shit, just, I don't know, get another 100 people and make uh, another black flaggy kind of piratey game. Mm -hmm. Now I've seen make the, uh... a half D1 in China and then, you know, maybe like a mobile app that ties into it and anyway. No, it's a... Uh... The list goes on. Assassin's Creed Syndicate is going to be another iteration of the very same formula we've all come to know and love. But there was Chronicles... Come to know. Come to yeah, know. there you go. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> you said it. But there was Chronicles that came out uh, a little while ago. I think it was like a month ago now. And that totally changed the game around that was that was the route that i thought they were going i wasn't expecting this at all they had chronicles which is going to have two more games in that mini series that are already planned and i think one of them takes place in the sort of same scenario that syndicate is going to be in mm. also when are they going to run out of you know like cool words to use as part of the name of <laughs> the assassin's creed games when they run out they'll just start calling them assassin's creed again Oh yeah, that's the reboot. 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 <laughs> like I it is very easy to be cynical about Assassin's Creed. And I agree with the sentiment that like when I see people getting hyped for it, and I I really and I'm not this kind of guy most of the time, but when I see websites that hugely profited on Assassin's Creed 4 being shitty, being like, Whoa, check out the new Assassin's Creed, I'm like, you are be be the change you want to see in the world. <laughs> yep. Websites that I'm not gonna name. Yeah. But <laughs> Like, for real, I, I can understand it, because, like, Assassin's Creed 2 was awesome, and Brotherhood was awesome, and 4 was awesome, and then people are like, maybe this one will be awesome, but I think every time, I don't know, I just, I can't get excited about the Assassin's Creed formula this anymore. This one's got gangsters and guns, though. Mm. Espe I don't know, especially because Environmental of Environmental destruction, too. Shadow of Mordor ended up being, like, a really good iteration good on that Assassin's Creed yes. formula. Mm. And had Batman combat that was as good as Batman. Yeah. Like, it, it, the combat was way more, I don't know, satisfying and, and stylish. And I, I kind of felt for a while that Assassin's Creed is just coasting on that sort of, like, you know, we've got fluid combat, but not, like, flu combat with fluids. You get the idea. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. I would do I don't that, know. too, though, if they had fluid combat with actual fluids. That'd be pretty cool. That'd be I don't know how they would yeah. work that out. It'd be like a hydromancer. Ever since Batman, like, kind of hit the scene, I feel like Assassin's Creed combat has been lagging behind. It doesn't feel as good. It feels it feels clunky now that you, we have right. this kind of rhythm-based combat that exists. And they've never taken the step to adapt and change. And every time it comes out, I'm like, this combat just doesn't feel That only makes good. me, oh, my God, that makes me so sure now that you've introduced the idea of rhythm-based combat. We are so <laughs> close to a Just Dance Assassin's Creed fusion. Oh, man, in like a year totally and a half. True. <laughs> Bring it on. I'm ready for it. Assassin's Creed Just Dance. I think what would help. Would connect integration. Oh, It'll shit. never happen. But what would help is if, you know, after Assassin's Creed Unity, people were like, maybe the franchise should take, like, a year off to re nah. not reboot, but like reinvent itself a little bit. And then in 2015, there's already been like four Assassin's Creeds. Yeah. Like Rogue came out on PC. Now Chronicles is coming out. They announced two more Chronicles games, like Bear said, and then Syndicate is announced as well. And you're like, you're you're Tony Hawking it. You're just like <laughs> you're, you're like you're meanwhile game, Tony Hawk is doing out. what they were advised to do in coming out with Tony Hawk Pro Skater Five later Which, this year. Looks really, really good. Really, really bad. bad. No. <laughs> oh, uh oh. <laughs> but well, look forward we'll to those dissenting opinions four months <laughs> later. But 
Man, you know how do you feel about it, Bear? You're the Assassin's Creed guy out of all of us, at least. I guess I am, aren't I? I didn't even like hold that mantle above my head, but yeah, it's uh, it's tough not to be very cynical, like we've been saying the whole time. It, it it's gonna have to do something that just totally fucking blows everyone away. That's the only way that they're gonna get out of this negative PR cesspool that they're in with the whole franchise. Like, there's not any. I'm looking right now at a blog that Ubisoft posted, like, on their own website. I'm looking at their list of what they're introducing as, like, the seven things you need to know about Assassin's Creed told to you by the developer of Assassin's Creed. So, you know, you can trust them. I would know. But, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I like Ubisoft, by the way. They're very nice to me. But uh, Twin Blades is the first one. We've seen that before. Isn't it starting in two? I think so, Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like the whole like Assassin's wrists, Creed 2, like two Twin wrists. Blades. This they used be... the two as part of the blades. They showed his wrists. And yeah. It, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, they did that. That happened. Like, I'm pretty sure we could look at the box art. That was there. <laughs> that happened in 2008. <laughs> uh, it's like the new setting, London. Okay. Okay, everyone's had a different setting. Yeah. Except for the ones course. that didn't. There is, okay, so there is now, I guess, <laughs> it says nobody fresher, nobody fresher than my click, which is a phrase Excuse I wonder me? has been <laughs> introduced to something before. Are you living mobile right now, Bear? What just happened? <laughs> <laughs> says, uh, you can, I guess, like, unite the street gangs of London. So you can, right, you can get to do that. crews together, but I can only guess, like, we've been told things like this before <laughs> that just boils down to, here's this cute, quirky little thing you can do, it yeah. doesn't really matter. I mean, like, you can, sure, well, but... Is, is it, I'm curious if it's just another, like, a reskinning of, like, the brotherhood mechanic that they introduced. Like, mm -hmm. you can gather all these people and, you know, yeah. you'll have a brotherhood. I'm like... All right, maybe they're just. That's gangs. why we called it Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. <laughs> but now they're calling it the family in this one, right? They keep saying join the family as part of their moniker. Yeah, it's for got it. like a Don Corleone sort of style to it, I guess. You don't fool us, Ubisoft. Mm -hmm. Continue. What else we got? We got looking good, feeling lethal, which I, I, I don't want to read the whole thing, but I'm, I'm just gonna venture a guess that that has to do with clothing, which is fun. The top hat. Looking mm -hmm. good, feeling lethal. <laughs> Sweet rides. Where did they get my Facebook status from yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> you get a burrito or something. Sweet rides. You can uh, you can ride around on chariots. Yep. It's it's London. Cool. And you're getting a stealthy upgrade. As Jacob enters a restricted area, he slips effortlessly into stealth mode. Yeah, the, taking off the top hat. Whipping off his stylish top Hoodie. hat and pulling up the familiar hood of his brethren. In Can he put his people. arms together in his sleeves and go into stealth mode double? Oh, no. Right? Become a monk. You can just, like, turtle up, just get all your body parts into your clothing. <laughs> never roll into a it. ball and fall over. <laughs> for, for Syndicate, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and I'll fact check that right now just to make sure I'm not spreading lies, but uh, there's no multiplayer, right? Like, they cut the multiplayer for the game? I think they did, yeah. And I'm, I'm of two minds about this. Yeah, why Assassin's Creed Syndicate won't have multiplayer? I think in a way that might be good to, I don't know, refocus the game and, and focus on making it a good single-player experience, but that also might just be spin. Like, it, it seems like once you start cutting features that have been in this franchise for a long time, it, it can be like a death knell. Like, I remember, I used to, this is just an isolated example, it doesn't necessarily mean it'll happen, but I used to be a huge fan of 2K's NHL franchise, and then, like, two years in a row, it was the same game with roster updates, literally. And then the third year, they cut, like, half of the features in the game. And then the next year, they stopped making it. Mm -hmm. And I was oh. like, well, I'm not saying that, that's, that the franchise is necessarily move, losing momentum, but I really liked the multiplayer in Assassin's Creed. That was, you know, one of my highlights. But I guess if, if this actually does give them more resources to focus on making the single-player workable and, you know, not glitched out to hell on launch, then that's good. That would be, yeah, that's like the ideal line of thinking is they're putting a bigger effort into making sure the <laughs> game doesn't release as a buggy mess, which... I want to give you a quote here. All right. Uh, all right. This, I'm trying to figure out who this person is. Okay, creative director Mark Alexis Cote. He says, the reason we're doing this is to really focus on the roots of the franchise. Fair enough. That's why all nine studios are focused on delivering the single-player experience. Whoa. Nine studios. I, that's nine... mostly just I didn't realize. Wow. 
Nine. That's a lot of people. That is... That's way more people than should be working on one game, right? Like, that no. seems... Too many cooks. Jeez. Too many cooks. No wonder the, the credits always take, like, 45 minutes. Yeah, run. credits are longer than the game, man. <laughs> Jesus. Nine studios working on that. Okay. That is That's absurd. crazy. Well, I mean, well, I don't want this... It, it's starting to feel more like Assassin's Creed is almost becoming a Madden style of franchise because they yeah. have to Madden every year can't just say we made this a little bit better of a football game. They have to have the the big seller like the the point of it. Like there was the this was like way back in the day. I haven't played Madden in a long time, but they had the uh, the hit stick is what they introduced mm, yeah. a few years ago. That was the big revolutionary change. And then every year they're just adding on little unique mechanics, like maybe one day you'll have uh, the sideline replay that you can like manipulate and then become 2007 Circa Patriots yeah. Spygate bullshit. But no, it's uh, Ubisoft now is having to go so far as to say like now you can use a throwing knife, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Yeah, that, that, it's almost gotten to that point. I really don't want it to be that because I. I still want these to be good. I still want to play these and enjoy them. But my most recent experience is with Unity and this, you know, the AAA Assassin's Creed releases. And that was just, it was nothing at all appealing to it, you know, mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have found in any of the six that came before it. Which, that sentence alone just sort of stands out in my mind of, I could play this, or I could play any of the other six, and yeah. now eight or nine that are available that provide b better, if not equal, experiences. Yeah. The statement you made about the adding and removing features and thing, like I, I almost wonder if they look at this in a larger scale and they're like, hey, sometimes we got to actually take a few features out so next time it can be exciting when we put them back in. <laughs> it's like right? taking well, the goddamn... Uh, turkey melt off the menu and then two years later yeah. saying introducing our new turkey melt there's only so many features when it comes to third person stealth action assassination game mm -hmm. i think it's clear that you know there, there's so many people working on this game for ubisoft and such a huge part of their actual annual revenue i'm assuming mm -hmm. that they're on like a, a three or four year plan at the very least so mm -hmm. i i kind of feel like what we're seeing now with this deluge of Assassin's Creed games is like the ripple effect of Assassin's Creed 4 being like, okay, we're going to green light a bunch of new stuff because Assassin's Creed 4 was really well received. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe we'll see like a, a dampening in a year or two based on Unity, or maybe they're actually just going to keep like tripling down. But I agree that, you know, this used to be like a really exciting franchise that people were really enthusiastic about. And now people are like, well, that's not totally true. We're like, oh, a new Assassin's Creed game. There, are, If you look at Twitter, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, this looks awesome. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, I'll tell you what, the environment, London, sounds like one of the coolest places they've gone to so far. I kind of like to walk around it at the very least just to see how they did. Well, they said that about the Order 1880. Did we? 1876, I didn't say that. Was, didn't people it? said that about Unity, too. I mean, and again, not necessarily you and not necessarily everybody, but that was their thing is like, it's like revolutionary France. There's going to be guillotines everywhere and right. you can have like a hundred people in the city square and you'll push through them and it totally won't be framey. And, <laughs> and they definitely will not just pop into existence in yeah. the middle of the sky and face will melt off. The best thing off. that I could come up with to be positive was the environment. So I think, it, I think it depends what you're into too. I think the Assassin's Creed thing is one of those things like the environment is like, do you like football, basketball, baseball, yeah. or hockey, right? It's like, do, what do you prefer, revolutionary France or, like, Victorian London or the Caribbean or, you know, uh, Boston in 1700 or yeah. whatever Assassin's Creed 3 was? All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a prediction here that I almost guarantee will be fulfilled within the next three years. There's going to be an iteration of an Assassin's Creed game that's going to be called Assassin's Creed uh, uh, Ratchet in Time or something <laughs> like that. It's going to be a game that allows you to traverse through every single past iteration of the franchise. Mm. Go through. They conveniently already had maps created for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. how yeah. weird is that, right? <laughs> You'll like go. Honestly... Oh, go ahead. No, I was gonna say I'm honestly surprised they never did. Like they haven't done like a modern day Assassin's Creed kind of it's thing. It's coming. They're working up to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. They did last year. It's called Watch Dogs. Oh, Watch, Watch Dogs. Dogs. <laughs> Watch Dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Which, actually, I wanted to talk about, not Watch Dogs specifically, Watch Dogs but, like, not only is it that there's too many Assassin's Creed games, for my taste, but because the Ubisoft games have been so similar in their 
format and the medium that they choose to deliver things, you know, with the mini map and the, you know, objectives popping up on it and then, you know, like a story that represents 15% of the game and 85% of it is side quests and collectibles. Mm-hmm. Not that I'm saying that's necessarily innately bad. I'm just like, I'm kind of sick of Ubisoft games. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. I played Find Far Cry 4. That was awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Far Cry 4 it, and Far Cry 3, of course, as well, did have a lot of that same, like, climb the tower, unlock more of the map. Yeah. You know, do racing missions, do this kind of mission, blah blah blah. But I would, I would like to see like if they could make a new Far Cry in a new environment with new weapons every two years. I'd be down with it for at least a little while. But the like the most unique game that Ubisoft has put out outside of the UB art stuff in the last year and a half has been South Park: The Stick of Truth, mm. which was great, but it was also like six and a half hours long, seven yeah, hours short. long. Even in the crew, you <clears> had to drive your racing car up a radio tower just to yep. try to unlock more of <laughs> Is that map. actually true? No, that's true. Is, this, no, is, no, that, is that real? Oh, oh, hold up. The, the crew has towers to unlock more of the map. Yes. No. But it's the United States. Yes. We already know what that looks you don't, like. You don't drive <laughs> up the tower. You drive... <laughs> To the tower. And then I'm serious. It's, oh, I'm dead God. serious. I was there making a movie. fucking no. joke. That's no, real. That's real. Shit, that is real. Man. I, nope, that's that is 100% just true. Ridiculous. I don't, no, I wanted it to be like you took your car and you had to like get enough speed to accelerate up <laughs> the top of the tower. You hit the it's jump so, perfectly. So, you, you right break, over the top. I'm you so break the like device tower off device. the radio tower that the bad guy put there, the mm-hmm. charismatic bad guy. Yeah. No, but you, uh, you you might just be misunderstood. You. you go off a ramp and it goes into like GTA slow mode, and you see your guy reach out the window, like yeah. <laughs> latch onto <laughs> this the thing. hacking yep. device that was on the top of the tower. He could just cause with, it with like, his hook. Even mm-hmm. with Far Cry Four, you were saying you enjoyed that. Far Cry Four was just a reskin Far Cry Three. No, oh, but the I... environment of that I... game is the environment was different. It makes it. I don't know. I think the environment of a Far Cry game is more meaningful than the environment of a, an Assassin's Creed game. Like to me, all the Assassin's Creed games have still largely been. This is a, a well, okay, okay, except for the Caribbean one, Assassin's Creed Four. There's a little different when you're sailing between islands, but it's mostly been like you're in a city and it's pretty congested and there's a lot of roofs. Like you can Everyone jump on the bridge. Yeah, no matter a whole where. lot of roofs and some roof guards. Mm-hmm. I, I thought like the new environment of Far Cry Four like really allowed them to reinvent the story instead of being kind of like. I don't know, I really didn't like the protagonist of Far Cry 3, but of Far Cry 4 is kind of like it's got that Tibetan, Nepalese kind of feel to it, and like some psychedelic stuff going on. It was, it's not my favorite story of all time, but I thought it was meaningfully different. I'll defend Far Cry 4 much more staunchly than I'll defend any iterations of the Assassin's Creed series. I think Far Cry's got a really good thing going with it. Like, <clears throat> that's kind of the style that I wish they would apply to Assassin's Creed. I would love to see an Assassin's Creed game every, like, two or three years, because that gives me... Even if they've already established a cycle where they are spending two to three years per game, it still feels to me, like, as a consumer of content, that they're just overloading, and when the games come out as buggy and as, you know, unsatisfactory as they are... That only lends more to people drawing the conclusion that they're rushing these out the door. Yeah. Whereas with things like Far Cry, they're clearly investing a lot of time, emotion, and money into making a unique enough experience that you know really drives forward the idea of what they're going for with the franchise. So Far Cry Four, I think, you know, really stood on its laurels a lot stronger. I would. I'm not going to say Far Cry Four is bad, but I would argue that it is not that different from Far Cry Three. I yeah, I agree with that. It's an iteration. It's not I, you, like a I huge mean, you evolution. used the phrase "reskin," which I thought was a little bit too dramatic. I don't but. see. It did I don't? I don't. I would say, okay. I'm not going to say building the world, the, the Tibetan world, whatever they're living in, is was grossly different. I, I definitely agree. But the gameplay, the guns, like even the wildlife mechanics and the taking over of the enemy bases, all of that is a direct rip from Far Cry Three. There is very little new gameplay in Why Far are you Cry Four. Go back to two. Two was even pretty similar as well. It was really only one I that departed from the. I formula. didn't really play two, I so I can't really talk about two. Oh, well, I mean, two is also boring as shit. So the is crawling it, uh, savanna. Yeah. I mean, you could yeah. light all the grass on fire. That was fun. I remember that. I remember, I remember seeing that in ads. Like you can light the grass on fire. Yeah, it was a big deal, man. Oh, I'm sure it was. I just didn't play two. So I, can't, I didn't really play two, so I can't really compare to two. So I don't know but what two. Compare was like. it to one though. One Far was Cry. like a, one was wildly falling. different. Yeah, yeah. It was different. one also came out in like 2006. Maybe even earlier, no? We're like, we're a little ways away from talking about that, I think. We, we don't want them to come out with one iteration every 10 years if you like the first game. Mm. Right, but right. Then you'd be like, Valve. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to say kind of Far Cry 4 is a huge departure from Far Cry 3, but the greatest the strength that makes it feel... No, no, no. Because for Assassin's Creed, they're coming out with more than one a year. Mm-hmm. 
Whereas okay. Far Cry 3 came out in 2012 and Far Cry so 4 came out in 2014. So is the argument it's okay as long as there's two years between it? I don't well, know. I mean, this is only one-to-one -one example, like like mm. three to four. Assassin's Creed, we've been under this deluge since like 2008, 2007. Mm -hmm. So it is the point where like, I, and even before like Assassin's Creed Unity, I don't remember people being so cynical about the amount of Assassin's Creed games. While they were still good, there was very little cynicism except around revelations a little bit but i think yeah. revelations people were like it's the first misstep and then assassin's creed 3 yeah. people were like you know this isn't really what i'm signing the up for but brotherhood and dlc in that region was when i started to get a little cynical but that was because i'm really cynical and i mean i'm sure like <laughs> unity and uh, you'll be right in unity was the tipping point because it was so fucking broken exactly yeah, yeah. so maybe i wonder if it wasn't broken people would be as cynical but the i pictures I mean, the hair and the teeth and the yeah. eyes were so good if <laughs> unity was great then we would be talking about this in a different light for sure yeah. because Far Cry 4 was also, or sorry, <laughs> yes, but Assassin's Creed 4 was also great. We'd be saying, oh, this is like a really strong franchise that has had two good iterations. Yeah, it's coming out every year, but as long as they keep being great, it's not that big of a deal. It's so much easier for people like us to establish a recency bias just based entirely upon what our experience was with Unity here. Like, that is the poison that they have to deal with. That's that's what I was talking about much earlier was they have this PR well that's just full of toxic vitriol spewed at them because mm. they've already failed a couple of times at producing the product that people want. So if they like it be it would be so easy to make the climb out of that if they just waited for a bit to, for it to die down, but they're trying to fight it as it grows is the thing it's like there's there's just not a ton of benefit ubisoft is under very negative life right light right now yeah they have been ever since watchdogs and unity and like there's a lot watchdogs was pretty good though is the watchdogs, thing. watchdogs is I, it's a vic it's not a great game necessarily but it's a huge victim of the circle jerk that surrounds it correct. mostly because of the fact that they did basically mislead the public about how the game was going to be at e3 yeah. Yeah, and and the the not I don't call it, say hackers, but people dug up the files were still in the game, mm -hmm. and they're like, this is how the game was gonna look and everything, and they never took them out. They're there. How ironic that the hackers unveiled the <laughs> know, right? oh dangers of watchdogs. Eh. Fucking Some data miners. Man. I'm not saying that that watchdogs was bad, but that was like Ryan said, a huge circle jerk to, to create a massive negative light on Ubisoft, and then Unity was another like kick in the balls. Mm. Well, where are you at, Ubisoft? I can't help but feel that Assassin's Creed is basically, like, it and Call of Duty switch positions as, like, the most hated annual franchise. Yeah, we don't even hear about the Call of Duty hate anymore. It Call, just Call of Duty happens Ghosts, now. Call of Duty Ghosts was good, and then Unity was bad, and I think yeah, if you're, like, Activision right now, you're like, yeah. <laughs> and, like, Thank there, this is, like, the least cynicism around Call of Duty's annual release in a long time. Yeah, but we were... I feel so weird about like championing this, championing this, whatever. But in a way, if you're going to come out with an annual franchise, I kind of would like Ubisoft to look at the, the way that Activision is doing it, where they have like three studios. Yeah. So they're actually kind of on a three year cycle. But they're just trying with the game to do that, that but they don't year. realize that they're not supposed to use all the studios at the same <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> Spread them out. They're like the, the PS3 of game development. Well, He's like all nine cores. Yeah, in a way, it's cool. It. <laughs> and I'm not the hugest Call of Duty fan, but in a way, it's cool that there is like, there. You know, this is a Treyarch Call of Duty game. It's gonna be. It's gonna have this character to it, this flavor. And this is a sledgehammer game. And maybe it'll be like Ghost. Maybe it won't. I forget what the the team making. Um, the the third team is now because it used to be. Oh yeah. Uh, Infinity um, Ward, and now it's obviously not right. Infinity Ward anymore. I but um. It, it's cool that uh, that they kind of have their own character, even though it's very easy to be cynical about the franchise as kind of just like a money-making product as opposed to a piece of art necessarily. But Assassin's Creed, you're just like, this is an Assassin's Creed game. Mm -hmm. the, the, the commonalities between them are like extremely apparent. Treyarch and then... I don't know. Well, anyway, yeah. The, uh, yeah, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. I'm skipping that. October is the 23rd, actually. I think I said the 24th. Here's, so, here's a good question. Mm -hmm. If Assassin's Creed V comes out and it's supposedly awesome, would you play it? Yes. If it's a great game, I will play it. Sure. I'll play Assassin's Creed Syndicate hoping it's a good game. 
I'll be honest. I'd rather not pre-order it, though. Yeah, I will not pre-order it. No, don't pre-order it. God, no. Don't do that. But I think... I think I'll play it when it comes out. It's assuming, like, even especially if I get a code for it, then yeah, I'll play it when it comes out. But like, I think I'm gonna pick it up and try, because I'm Fingers still, crossed. I think I'm still biting on the bait and hook here. I don't know if you saw the other thing Ubisoft did was last week they were asked in an interview, "Is the division this last Friday is the division mm, yeah. still on schedule for 2015?" Mm-hmm. And then today they're like the end of 2016. Huh. They pushed it. The Did they say the end of 2016? Uh, or, or? They said the end of the fiscal whatever year, which is around March of 2016. Oh, the end of the 2015 fiscal year. Okay, yeah, so whenever March March 2016 is. I'm now t- I'm starting to think about this. I only know of two Ubisoft studios. They have nine working on this. There's Montreal, San Francisco. There's Toronto got shut Toronto down. Toronto got shut down. Do they have Quebec? I think they have Ubisoft Quebec. Maybe not. But I'm not sure. check it out right now. Yeah, I get. I mean, like, well, the only reason I'm saying that is if they've got nine studios working on Syndicate, then it doesn't, you know, like hold water that they'd be able to put the effort toward the division. I, <laughs> I have like, a, I they am, have maybe thirty studios. Oh Jesus! Yeah. <laughs> I, am, I, am, wow. I am terrified for how the division is going to turn out because they fucking super hyper sold it on its a couple initial like announcements, very much like they did with Watch Dogs. Yeah. And if it doesn't come out the way that people expect it to, <laughs> like Watch Dogs. Even if it's a good game, people are gonna explode. Mm. Like, I, I need to literally like combust. It's gonna yeah, be it's gonna be a mess. Light on fire. Ubisoft like the did not shut down. Okay. Jade Raymond just left the studio. Okay. I, so here's Ubisoft. I'm just gonna give you the the highlights from their studios. They have Red Links, obviously, who makes the Trials games. Oh, okay. And then, but of just the Ubisoft city name ones, they have. Anna C, best known for multiplayer on Assassin's Creed, Barcelona, Blue Bite, Blue Bite. Mans, I guess most of these are in France. Uh, Ubisoft Sofia, Ubisoft Casablanca, Ubisoft Chengdu, Dusseldorf, Japan, Malmo, Milan, Montpellier, wow. Montreal, Nagoya, yeah, wow. Paris, Poland, Pune, Quebec. Is it Ubisoft Poland? Yeah. Wow. Quebec. Wow. Red Storm Entertainment. I think they might have made the first Rainbow Six games. Um, Ubisoft Reflections, Romania, San Francisco, Shanghai, Singapore, Toronto, and Ukraine. Jeez. Well, that's like shit. that's like twenty. Right yeah, now. that's not Crazy. even all of them then. Well, anyway, <laughs> Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Uh, talk to, so talk to October twenty third, and we'll we'll get back to you. Okay. If it's good, I still can't see myself playing it. I need like a couple years. I mean, this will be a couple years off from playing those games, but yeah, I need like a I need a fresh. Some, I don't. I don't. I think I might not even ever play. I, I might need like enough time. Like I can't see it right now. I'm just like you could come out with the best Assassin's Creed game, and I'll be like, eh. Yeah. Did you play yeah. Black Flag? I played uh, probably like six or seven hours of Black Flag mm-hmm. and a lot of the multiplayer. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked it a lot. I never finished the campaign because I like with Black Flag. I was like the boat stuff cool. Combat's a little samey. I don't know. That could use a reinvention. And here we are, like two years later. Maybe most people don't want that, but yeah, I, I'm not getting what I need out of the franchise right now. Do you right. do you think that the public sees how bad Unity was and they go, "Oh, well, obviously they know they can't release something that bad again, so that means this time we're guaranteed to get a better game." No, I think it works like that. Uh, I think it's like the public opinion, as we're saying, like has not really been swayed because there's still a lot of the hype machine rolling out of the station as soon yeah. as they announce stuff like this. It just feels like no matter how bad anything is, people pre-order it anyway. I think 90% of people that bought Unity probably don't think it's a bad game. Mm. The people that, you know, talk about this stuff online and are, you know, not... Because in, in video gaming press, there's like a huge stratification. There's like, you know, ca- the casual people who talk about video games online on Twitter that we would like interact with are still in like the top 5% or 10% of people within the hobby at all. Yeah. I think it's... It's like the one percent, like us, and you know, other professional writers and stuff like that, that that understand the cynicism surrounding Unity. I bet most people bought it, and they're like, "It's not my favorite Assassin's Creed, but it's still Assassin's Creed." And yeah, I think much right. of the the sentiment around Syndicate is probably going to be people that'll find like they'll see an ad for it when they walk into GameSpot or something like that. Sorry, GameStop, and they'll be like, "Oh, Assassin's Creed in England. That sounds cool." Like at least they're doing something gotcha. new with the franchise, you know, not, not just keeping <laughs> it in France <laughs> again. <laughs> I really think that that's that's how most people look at it, which is fine, right, but you know, right. it, yeah. I, I think that a lot of what we discuss is kind of intellectual 
and like in a way even kind of like masturbatory. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, point. People are very familiar with the franchise and I, I think they want that sometimes. They want that familiarity. I'm going to add the uh, tag to us on iTunes of masturbatory. I think that's a really good descriptive <laughs> Hashtag keyword. Masturbatory. All right, moving on from that, we want to talk about, uh, well, speaking of Poland to a certain degree, Ubisoft Poland there, uh, The Witcher 3 coming out next week, I guess it'll be. Seven days from yeah, today. So yeah, so that'll be actually in like three days once the podcast is out, so hype for Witcher 3. Woo. I think we're all pretty hype for Witcher 3, right? Yeah, we yeah. are. We are on that train. No, don't Ryan. pre-order it, though. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't yeah, pre-order. don't pre-order. They, like, over a million people already have, so if you're one of those, then fine, but don't it's do it now. Especially, <laughs> especially if you're getting a digital de- like uh, digital version. There's no, You're not going to sell out. There's no need to pre-order it. Wait, Mathis, they might run out, though. <laughs> I've had it happen before online. <laughs> All right, no, okay, a bit of a divergence. Have you guys ever experienced that? Have you ever no. not been able to get a game that you wanted to get because they were out of copies? No. I'm pretty sure I have, but I can't remember when or why. It was a long time ago, if if at all. Never. I don't think they're even trying to use that as a selling point. You know, like traditional retailers, like they've they've realized, pre-order it before it goes away is not, uh, you know, a valid marketing technique. Oh, I was talking about digital. To... Oh yeah, well even further than that, right? But people run out of Steam codes apparently. Those. Yes, very Depends odd. Depends on the developer story. you talk to. Yeah. The only thing you should pre-order is Amiibos, because those have a genuine <laughs> scarcity. <laughs> Don't talk to me about All right, anyway. Uh, so there's a, there's a little bit of hot water boiling here between Green oh. Man Gaming and CD Projekt Red. Good job. Thank you. Is that pretty accurate? Uh, we wouldn't know. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt developer CD Projekt Red said that a deal on Green Man Gaming uh, that's selling codes... They were selling codes of the game for $40. They are now uh, selling them at, I believe it's like, if not the full 60 I think it's like 10% off at most. But uh, supposedly, Green Man Gaming acquired those codes from... An unknown source is what they say. Mo- the most important factor of it being they did not buy them from CD Projekt Red. So there is uh, sort of a lively debate going on there as far as uh, key resellers in general and uh, whether or not Green Man Gaming is, you know, kind of within their rights to resell keys they purchased from supposedly valid retailers that are providing CD Projekt Red with the income. Another very important thing to note here is Green Man Gaming is not, you know, screwing over CD Projekt Red as much as they would have you believe. I'm just going to call them CD Projekt Red. They're they're (laughs) providing the income to the developer just in sort of a, you know, circumvented roundabout way, and Green Man Gaming is the one that's eating the losses here. They're they're offering the discount to to their own detraction because they are, you know, like, they want to be involved with the sale of that game. So, now it boils down to, A, are Green Men Gaming, you know, in the right, quote-unquote, in doing this, and B, is CD Projekt Red, like, responsible for allowing even kill distribution of their game across whatever platforms. And then there's the final wild card to all of this, which is something that a lot of people may not realize, that CD Projekt Red and GOG.com, which is where the game is primarily being sold, are, I don't know if they're sister companies or how that actually works, but they are in uh, in the works with one another. They, they work together. Like they're both Poland, based yeah. out of Poland. They're, they operate... Kind of other under the same umbrella. I wouldn't. I, I don't know enough about it to make a declaration of what that you know business protocol is. But they are working in congruence with one another. So it's an interesting situation there. So you have to wonder like whether or not CD Projekt Red almost wanted to establish a sort of retail monopoly with GOG to try to push the launch of Galaxy, which conveniently is coming out in beta form right alongside the release of The Witcher Three. CD Projekt Red uh, wholly owns GOG. Okay. So there's that. So, around around the table. I've never said that before on this show. <laughs> How cute is that? Oh, man. Well, 
I have one core question, mm-hmm. and that is why won't GMG disclose their source? Yeah, right, that if, is interesting. If it's authorized. Mm-hmm. That's that's the, the real stick in the mud, right? Why? Uh, I'm, I'm so uncomfortable with that kind of question, though. It's like the, you know, that, that old idiom or the expression of like, well, you know, why can't we like invade your privacy if you've got nothing to hide? Oh, right. yeah, but don't take it to that degree with this. Yeah. I think this is... Uh, a know, question see, of legitimate of business that, practice. It, it could be a sketchy source. Like, I, I'll admit that if it was all on the up and up, my first instinct would be the same. Like, why don't they do that? But I don't know. Maybe they've got some kind of legitimate competitive advantage over other, like, resellers that they don't, don't disc- they don't want to disclose because, I don't know, companies like G2A or something will pop in and, and take advantage of it. Maybe not that. Like, I don't know anything about it. But Just G2A, disclose G- it to yeah. Project Red then. Uh, right? That's true. Yeah. What, That's what true, yeah, be, you don't have to tell everybody. What would be then the legal basis? Because I, I don't want to turn it into a sort of comparison to that argument of if you have nothing to hide, then just show us where you're getting the keys from. Mm. They're not yeah. at, like a moral obligation to tell us where they're getting these things from. I, I'm concerned about the the validity of what they're doing as a whole. I think, like, I've been... I've been really okay with Green Man Gaming. Like, I like Green Man Gaming, and then, like, yeah, up to this point, I think they have been, like, a very reputable service. Mm-hmm. And then you compare that to something like G2A, who I'm okay with yeah. burning bridges with right now, because fuck them. Like, they are... They, they're they known, they're notorious and infamous for being a sort yeah. of shady, under-the-table reseller of keys. They've been caught doing shitty shit in the past multiple times. Just real G2A. shitty shit. Shitty just shit. Kind of shit, shitty shit. Not like shitty. regular shit, like mm-hmm. shitty shit. With, mm-hmm. with G2A, it is well known that they have kind of like that separate section of the site where people can resell keys that they have, like not even affiliated with the company, and the yeah. company just takes a right. cut of it, which kind of seems like it's enabling really sketchy reselling, even if the company isn't directly involved in it. They've provided the infrastructure for it to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, c- comparing the two, I think, is apples and oranges. I just, I am surprised at two things here. I'm surprised at how this is being handled. Because I never expected Green Man Gaming to come out. I never expected either of them to try to make a public scandal about this. Because I guess it got to the point now where CD Projekt Red has to come to people like GameSpot and say, these people are doing something kind of awful. Let's bring this to the public light. And now Green Man Gaming is is having to come out and essentially give them a PR bitch slap. Because they responded with like their official statement that said, we, we wanted to work with you guys, but you wouldn't. So we had to, you know, circumvent the traditional routes that we take here and find a way to provide this game to the customers we have that want to buy it through us. Which, you know, it's kind of an argument that whether or not they're capable of making that is up to debate still, too. But... There's, see, so yeah. There's those two things that very much surprise me with how they've, how they've decided to deal with this, and you know, it's it's all out there now, and it kind of makes them look like kids a little bit. It yeah. it kind of undermines them both professionally, that they had to basically come out and tell mom that Big Brother was doing something terrible, and let the mediators or like the arbitrators of who's in the right here decide that for them, which is an issue that I never really even expected to surface at all, really. It's true. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot to say. I think it's just, like you said, it's all kind of out there right now, and we don't have answers. We're probably not going to get answers. Um, who's Maybe they're both a little bit in the wrong, depending on you know what they each did. Um, you know, CD Projekt Red not working with Green Man Gaming for whatever purposes that may be, whether it be deferred to their own GOG goals or whatever, and then maybe Green Man Gaming being sketchy on how they got their codes. It's it's muddy waters, hmm. no matter how you look at it. So I think. It, oh, oh, go ahead. I think <laughs> the only real impact for me is just that I'm just going to be a little bit more cautious looking at them. I mean, I've looked at GMG like pretty reputable. I've used them a lot. Um, mm. And I would even go so far as to say I would be fine with being a partner with them if they wanted. Um, wow, but don't use this, this platform now. I'd be like, hey. <laughs> no, that's not <laughs> right. I just mean, like, I, I would say they generally would have my endorsement aside from this one thing that I'm like, all right, maybe I need to be a little bit more cautious and mm. watch out. Because, you know, I guess anybody can fall into traps like this. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's not good. But I also don't know enough about it to really have a strong opinion. 
Yeah, I actually did. Uh, well, I have a an existing affiliate partnership with yeah. Rayman Gaming, and I I had to email my contact there, and I had to say, hey, uh, this is kind of bad. What's, yeah. what's going on here? And he well, like he provided me their official response in a reply in an email, and said like, hey, you know, this is just a weird thing that we're having to deal with, but don't worry <laughs> about it. Which we didn't even really say. Don't worry about it. I just kind of took it to mean, you know, it's it's being blown out of proportion, which it very well could be. I think it honestly kind of is a just sort of a weird playground dispute that they're having that may mm-hmm. just be brushed under the rug in a month or so. Well, I th- especially after the game has been released, I think this is all going to be completely forgotten. But hope so. I think the bigger uh, discussion point here is just. Key resellers in general, there, there's, you know, it's a, it's a developing marketplace because, as we said, like there's three that I can, you know, come to mind with immediately. GOG doesn't really fall under that same uh, label just because they're dealing more with uh, rehashing old classic releases and making them available to play on modern machines. But now with them trying to become a direct competitor to Steam, do we need? Do we need more people going that route, or do we need more people trying to, you know, provide the 50% off of new game releases by getting them in bulk from uh, Taiwanese retailers or something like that? I don't know. It's like the way that they go around the entire system. Is it that bad of a thing, really, I guess is what it boils down to here. I think it's bad for the developers, but it's good for the consumer and I, I don't know, but I, I hate that argument because I do think that the distributors should be protecting both parties if possible. Mm, right. And mm. the reason that, you know, a company like CD Projekt Red comes out with the game at different prices in different regions is because people in different regions have different, you know, spendable cash, basically, you know, different uh, uh, purchasing power. So if they came out with a, a game at $60 USD, the equivalent of that in, like, Ukraine or something like that, not to pick on a country unnecessarily, but that might really limit the amount of people that can play it there, which is not only bad for business, but is also kind of like a feel-bad story. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it does suck that people are taking advantage of that to benefit, but it does benefit the consumers in other parts of the world. But I think it's like, this is such a unique case. You, we have this really fringe scenario where the game publisher is publishing a game that's definitely going to be their biggest of all time and for the first time in their history could be one of the biggest game releases of the year. Like, I don't think The Witcher 2 had nearly this level of of push behind it when it came out. Mm -hmm. So, not only do you have that, this is their biggest release ever, but they own the distribution platform that they probably want most people to buy it on. So, it's almost like a little bit of like a, and not to insult CD Projekt Red, but a little bit of like a have your cake and eat it too. Because the game's still going to be for sale on Steam, which gives the impression of like, oh, we'll work with Steam because we can't afford to like make any enemies there. Right, They're yeah. enormous. But we're going to like kind of strong arm smaller distributors to push people towards GOG so, so that we get more of a share of the profit. Right. And I can totally understand that because this is like their game. This is yeah. the biggest thing they've ever done. But at the same time, you know, I can understand why GMG would go outside of, uh, you know, if CD Projekt Red won't work with them, they're like, well, this is a big game for us. So, yeah. you know, it's going to be one of the biggest games of the year. <laughs> we we need to, like, get keys for it somehow. And, it, and it, it's just a unique situation. Yeah, there's the precedent that you're establishing now, though, is they have the freedom to tell people, no, you can't. Yeah, you're a major distribution platform. I think Green Man Gaming is in the top three. As far as, you know, well, there's Steam, obviously, and then there's everyone else. But, you know, yeah. in that same tier, I think Great Man Gaming is up there. But CD Projekt Red is more than likely within their legal jurisdiction, I guess, if you even want to get to that point of the argument of being able to say, no, you can't sell this. We're going to sell this on Steam and then almost exclusively on our own distribution platform. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Look at Origin. Oh, yeah. Good. They're they're a hundred percent in the legal woods to make them bad guys, maybe a little bit, but if they say no, that's their like you said, that's their hundred percent in the legal right to say no to you. Mm-hmm. And if you go in behind their back and you know do something scummy about it and try and get the keys, you know, in a shady way, they have the right to be like, you can't be doing that because we already said no to you. And to, for them to come out and be like, well, you wouldn't work with us. It's a dick thing for them not to work with you, but there's also no rules to say that they can't. Like, they can't do that. They have mm. the right to say no. And sometimes you just got to swallow it and be like, 
All right, let's move on then. I did just realize, by the way, I missed my perfect opportunity to drop the I am contractually obliged to say this line. <laughs> uh, as far as my Green Man Gaming affiliate is concerned, damn it. Uh, drop the ball I there. will say, it. I, don't, I think it, it's a business decision for CD Projekt Red, yeah. which always has the dangerous thing of being like, you know, coming across as anti-consumer. Like they want to create, yep. they want to strong arm other distributors so that the game is bought at X price and then it doesn't drive down the, the retail price of it. But... It, it comes across as almost like more of an ethical knock on GMG, from what yes. we know at least, which is kind yeah. of like, well, if you're not going to work with us, we're still going to do what we're going to do anyway, uh, but like you're not necessarily going to get as much of a cut of it. It kind of seems like, well, if you're like, we're going to do it one way or the other, so you might as well work with us, which yeah. is also kind of, that's like a mafia tactic, basically. Yeah, very mafia. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, yeah. I mean, GMG, I agree with you guys that it, it has been reputable in the past, and they do offer like really good deals and my understanding has been not that i have any insider information on it that they end up taking the the loss right. on a mm -hmm. lot of those games if they offer like a ten dollar discount that ten dollars comes out of what they right. what earn mm -hmm. which is a really i mean i guess that's what you got to do to compete with steam that's, they're trying to build a community and then eventually yeah. well ideally for them i guess those uh splits would go away and they yeah. would eventually just right. sell I mean, things that, that makes me think that they're they're not even in really a big enough position to where they can start to barter with developers and with all the other parties involved to say like will you take a cut here so we can offer a discount on our distribution platform they can't really do that so they have to just take the losses themselves which i'm sure is you know working out to them to a certain degree otherwise they wouldn't still be around but yeah, yeah. it's uh, they well there isn't really any sort of like who in the hell sorry this has been like the 40th time the the whole podcast someone really needs to talk to me maybe I should address that but is it a phone call? <laughs> yeah I've gotten like three phone calls from the same number in the past five minutes Might you should google the phone number man I should actually you want to do that live it's green man right gaming it's <laughs> <laughs> <Ubisoft. laughs> excuse me it's abort the stream <laughs> they've got the red phone for me it was like hey bear taffy's saying something negative <laughs> figure that out you said they wiretapped your house right that's true oh shit yeah now I'm starting to freak out a little bit <laughs> uh yeah it's uh it, it's very gray territory still. And, like, I think... I don't know if there really needs to be any sort of, you know, like, Supreme Court litigation of are they within their right. bounds to do this. I think it's just going to be a matter of... These companies are going to figure out amongst themselves, all right, obviously there's ways for us to go around you if you say no to us, so let's think of something that is mutually beneficial and not be childish about this anymore, which is probably going to be... Okay, yeah, there you go. Good. Figured it out. Yeah, it's probably going to be what they end up having to do at some point to avoid things like this. It's never going to happen again. At least not until, like, I, I don't know, like Half-Life 3 comes out or something like that. Oh, God. Like, it's, it's such a unique situation that, like, it's this, well, I guess Half-Life 3 will just be on Steam. And it, who cares? Anyway, <laughs> it's, so, it's so irrelevant. But, like... GOG is owned by the company making this game. And I don't know, you could you could totally frame it the other way too. It's like, hey, unlike Scumbag EA, they're actually going to sell their games on multiple platforms, but they're just trying to push you towards like the the one platform that they own. I don't know. I think I think this like is seriously like the one time this will ever happen with with GMG under current management anyway. Yeah, probably. Or you'd be like Ubisoft and just boot it up from Steam and force you to go to Uplay and then boot up the game from Uplay and then you get to yeah. play the game. Which is really consumer friendly. <laughs> uh, no, I have so I'm not, much RAM. Yeah, no kidding. I'm just starting to realize how prevalent that's becoming. We got UPlay, Origin, Galaxy's coming around now. We got Steam, Battle obviously, Net. Battle.net. Yeah, there's a lot of them. At least every we can, can we set it up so it has to daisy chain through every one of them somehow? <laughs> <laughs> Open all five platforms or whatever they are. I've even got like I've got most of these in my taskbar. I've got Battle.net, Steam. I've got the Galaxy tab now. I had UPlay, but I took that away because I stopped ever playing things on it. I still have Desura. Loads up on oh, Startup. Rockstar, oh, yeah. really? Rockstar has their own now. On Social yep. Club. Oh yeah, man, that's. Hold another Conver fucking station. Mm -hmm. Conver fucking Conver station. Fucking station. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, that's that whole debacle. Witcher 3 comes out on Tuesday. 
Can't wait. It's gonna be, it's gonna be yeah. a fucking fantastic game. God, let's be honest. It's gonna be really great. Can't wait. All right. So, World of Warcraft has lost three oh, million yeah. subscribers uh, this quarter, which they claim is to be expected, and I, you know, I totally believe is to be expected. After they release a big expansion pack or new content or something like that, the, they get a big insurgence followed by a big decline. Which the is, biggest expansion pack they've released since Wrath of the Lich King, I think. You were going to say Lamb. Lamb. Yeah, I know you were going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> it was in my mind. <laughs> So uh, the current subscriber count is sitting around 7.1 million. Uh, last year, at this same time, it was around 7.6. They've been peaking at just over 10 million subscribers uh, ever since, I, I think it was about, like, Wrath of the Lich King. They've gotten around that territory, so they're hovering. It, well, obviously, them, yeah, yeah, they were getting up there. Obviously... They have 7 million subscribers. Still, World of, World of Warcraft prints money for Blizzard. That much yeah. is obvious still. But now it's, uh, this, is, this is a noticeable decline because of the, you know, like the, the rapid flow of subscribers out of the game after the release of the new mm -hmm. batch of content. Well, yeah. So here's, so here's the presentation of the two topics. A... Is World of Warcraft going to be sticking around for much longer? And B, what does the scope of MMOs just look like in general these days? I feel like MMOs still have a place. Um, an article came out today, I believe, where it was noted that Square Enix doubled their profits from last year, and most of that was because of Final Fantasy XIV, mm. uh, still a subscription-based MMO that is doing phenomenally well for themselves and doing really, really well. Um, it's not as big as it used to be because a lot of the people who grew up with MMOs are now have jobs, and the people that uh, have the time to play MMOs are in a different gaming environment than we were 10 years ago. There's a lot more quick things to play. Dota, League of Legends, you know, Here's the Storm. That's kind of taken the place of what MMOs used to be. As far as WoW and why they're losing it, I feel like a lot of it is because the new expansion took away, I don't know if any of you play WoW at all at any point in time. I played it a lot. I was okay. actually so obsessed that I had to quit it. Whoa. Welcome to, I was with you. I'm with you. Did you play the new expansion at all? The last one I got to is Cataclysm, and I okay. stopped cool. after that. And now with the, you guys, Ryan? Not at all, no. no. I played, I uh, got the trial and took my character to level 15, and then I okay. got bored. So not really, gotcha. Mm. So the problem with... Everybody was really stoked for this new expansion pack because it undid a lot of what Miss of Pandaria um, kind of broke and why people ran from Miss of Pandaria. Miss of Pandaria introduced more daily quests than any other expansion has ever introduced. Uh, it was all about just logging on, doing the daily, grind, 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 grind. Um, and this expansion kind of got rid of that. It presented more story. There were more cutscenes. The quests were more fluid. There wasn't really questing hubs. You kind of just went from zone to zone and stories kind of unfolded and it was a lot more natural progression. And you got your own base that you got to build and, and decide what buildings you wanted depending on your profession. And it was very, very cool. The mm. problem is once you kind of upgraded your garrison, which was your, your base that you built, um, it quickly became apparent that the daily quests were replaced with kind of Facebook daily stuff that you did in your garrison instead. So mm -hmm. every day you would go into your garrison and you would send off your NPCs to go do that. And the NPCs would take time and you would watch the timer go down until they oh, came no. back mm -hmm. and succeeded and brought you a reward. So you instead of going game. out... <laughs> yes. So instead of going out and doing these daily quests, you would just log on, stay in your garrison alone because nobody else was involved unless you had them in your party. And you just go building to building, clicking on the NPCs, sending them off to do their tasks coming back the next day, gathering the rewards, and then sending them off again, completely removing the like big hub cities that they would have in every expansion where you would see other players and interact and go do things, and instead making it a very solo, kind of lonely experience where you just went and clicked on things. Mm. And if you were in a guild, maybe you'd raid once a week or whatever it was. Uh, and it was a very different feel, and I think people were very excited for that because you got to have this customization, and it was a lot more story-focused. But once you got through all of that, what you were left with was mobile Facebook cow clicking games to get your rewards for the day. And people started really hating that. <laughs> that makes me really sad. I was getting excited when you were talking about the garrison stuff. I was like, oh, that actually sounds pretty neat. And yeah. It was really cool. Building it and like unlocking new building plots and then deciding what building you want to build there and watching the building like kind of land down in a very World of Warcraft animated way. Mm. Really, really fulfilling and really fun. 
But once you were past that and you kind of hit and did everything you were supposed to, what you're left with is non-social, just kind of log in every day for 20 minutes, click on things, then log out. There weren't even... There's got to be, like, instances of enemies trying to take out your garrison and no. stuff like that, right? No? No, 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 no. That's mm -mm. so obvious, isn't nope. it? That's just yeah, like but the you, natural you, thing The thing is, do. you take over the land and make it safe to build the garrison. That's oh like my god, you. man. Let them, like, fight over garrisons. Yeah, that would be really cool. When you log would... out, your garrison's safe, but if you're in the world, you gotta always be protecting that shit. Wouldn't that be awesome? Like, PvP? Like, un like flag your garrison for PvP? Yeah, man. But everybody's oh, garrison is in the same exact place. It's just phased. It's oh, phased. That's what I was gonna on. say. When they no. started the phasing is when it all went to shit. Yeah. I hated phasing. So, like, you all, like, you and your friends are running to your, to your garrison, and as you're getting close, all your friends phase out because they're all going to their garrison, but oh, it's all in the God. same spot. Split up the world. The whole point was so you could play a game together, and then you split them back up again and fragmented it. Yep, it, it became more lonely in this expansion, which is a shame because I remember, I think I talked to you, Bear, when the, when the expansion came out initially, how much I was playing it. I was loving it. Mm -hmm. I was having a really good time with it. And then, uh, oh yeah, like I said, over time you realize how lonely of an experience it becomes. I, I only hit the wall of go do, or go get this many of this thing for this reason. That was what all the quests boiled down to, and that was a, the point at which I was like, I don't really want to do this anymore. But, yeah, like, that just, God, just right away, I'm thinking of how cool that could be. Yeah. But it's not. Unfortunately. That's but really sad. But Final <clears throat> Fantasy XIV has introduced their own base system, and it's supposedly really good. Oh. So, I mean, the, the general discussion involves a couple of things that have, you know, or a few games that really have kind of tried to provide the resurgence of the MMO experience uh, in different ways, notably mm -hmm. so in these different games. So, like uh, Matthews was saying, there's Final Fantasy XIV, which is, well, when we look back at it, at Final Fantasy XI, and how... Awful that was. Ju I liked from it. Like a mark you liked Final Fantasy XI. I played, I played a lot of XI. Well, oh, yeah, XI was pre-WoW. Oh, XI was before WoW had set what the standard would yeah. be. I'll grant you, though, that it wasn't very good, but I liked it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah fair enough. But there... Oh, yeah, but they, now they've got Final Fantasy XIV, which is obviously, you know, kind of skyrocketing in popularity a little bit. Uh, we've got the Elder Scrolls Online, which <laughs> kind of just failed. It was... Uh, it... it had it, it failed, really I think, because drab. it yeah, it, it tried to do a lot of the classic MMO stuff, which is sort of <laughs> where I'm basing the argument of that doesn't really work anymore in, you know, like modern tastes of what people want out of games. And then there's things like Destiny, which are you know, maybe the the definition of uh classic MMO is being stretched a bit when you consider Destiny in that tier, but it is very much, you know, vying for the top spot now for MMOs in general. Like, it's it had a huge release. The The viewership on Destiny's announcement of the new content coming out, I don't actually know the name of it off the top of my head, but there were... House of Wolves, I think? Something like that? Yeah, that yeah something right. like that. But there were 180,000 people watching that reveal on Twitch, which wow. is a huge number. So, you know, tons of interest still in that game. But, yeah, it's... Uh, it's kind of a landscape that's shifting a lot, and I don't know if MOBAs have a lot of relevance there. I was thinking about that when you brought that up, is like maybe the alternative that I people think they are do, now. to be honest with you. I think the they relevance have a whole is, lot of relevance. They're cleaning up after all the people that are leaving WoW with their $10 skins on Heroes of the Storm. Mm. I mean, <laughs> as someone who hasn't really spent that much time playing MMOs, please correct this if this is incorrect, but... My perception of the MMO landscape is that it's a bunch of, like, this is going to sound offensive, but, like, a bunch of junkies that are kind of, like, looking to get back to that first high. Yeah. Like, oh, has, yeah. has yeah. there been a, a, an MMO that people have considered great since 2004 that has also been successful? Not, not well, probably. I mean, they're all gone they, now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm... I will completely admit that for the longest time after leaving WoW, I kept chasing chasing the high, as you described it, yeah. by going to new MMOs and looking for the next big thing that was going to get me hooked in the world and I was going to spend days playing the game. Uh, never found it because, it, you know, it's impossible. Not even Lotro? 
I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, pl- I, pl- I played Lotro. I played Matrix Online. I've played, you name the MMO, and I've played Play a little it bit for. of Wildstar in there. Wildstar, I definitely Terra. played Conan. I played Terra. I played, played some Rift. Rift, I played. I tried to really like Rift. Star Wars. Trek Online. Star Trek Online, I played. Star Wars, Kodor, you know, I played that too. I played universe. them all. Did you play the universe? Eve Online, I played, I played Eve Online. Shit, I've tried Eve playing Online. Eve Online oh my God. multiple times. I've tried playing Eve Online. <laughs> I thought we were um, going to break him. Yeah, we shit, did. he's got it. I, you name it, I've Secret played it. Secret World? Secret World, I tried. Yeah, really? I like it. Yeah, I played it. The thing with Secret World is combat, at least at the time, was messy as fuck. Damn. I've, I've played so like I've played so many MMOs in my lifetime. It was my, my shit back in the day. Um, but I, like I, the reason I use MOBAs and like why I think they're the thing that's kind of taking the place of MMOs is because those who grew up with MMOs who really like them don't necessarily have the time to invest in them anymore. And MOBAs don't take a lot of time to play a game or two. You can play a round of Dota in 45 minutes to an hour at most. You can play Heroes of the Storm for 20 minutes to 30 minutes because they're I super quick. You get that the rush of victory, the rewards afterwards of getting like experience points or gold or whatever you can spend, um, and you get that feeling of teamwork of playing with friends in a much smaller time frame, and you're not, not paying a monthly fee. You're not, you don't feel... That was another thing that I really hated with MMOs later on in my life is I felt like I was playing it because I was paying for it. And I was like, I'm paying $15 right. a month. I might as well log on and play. It became a chore... And once I cut that and I started looking into MOBAs, I was like, I can play this. I can get the same, you know, successful feeling from one game in a half hour, 45 minutes that I would get from doing a raid for four fucking hours and not get anything from it. And I think in, in, a, in a world where kids are growing up with League of Legends and Dota and stuff, that's what people are playing more of. And uh, mo- I'm not saying MMOs are going to disappear, but you can see there's different design decisions when it comes to them now there's structures like micro mmos i mean the whole Mm -hmm. premise is that you level up really quickly with your team yep and then it's over and you start again yep you level up you're getting yeah exactly you're getting that leveling up feeling and unlocking new abilities and getting more powerful all in 45 minutes consciously designed that way yeah oh yeah for sure it just seems to me like and again this is from an outsider's perspective but every mmo that comes out First couple of days, people are like, hey, this is pretty cool. Like, I'm having a good time with it. And then gradually over the course of, like, a couple weeks, people just stop talking about it. And then six months, people are like, no, nah, man, no, nah, this is a premium product. This isn't yeah. going free to play, man. It's ne- No, nah. you know, I know every other MMO that's come out <laughs> in the past eight years has gone free to play. Not this one, though. This one's, and then it goes free to play, like, six months later. And then, you know, maybe the community picks up after that. I don't know. But I, I feel like it's wow is coming from, like, this... In, like, if that's your point of reference, is this huge cultural phenomenon. It still has 7 million subscribers, 7.3, apparently, like Bear said. Hearthstone just crossed 10 million players. So Hearthstone is, like, hugely at the forefront of public consciousness within the industry. WoW is still, like, 73% of that, and it's 11 years old. I'd be curious to see, once Heroes of the Storm comes out, what kind of player base they're going to garner. Um, Never I doubt know. Blizzard. I think oh, it's yeah, no, the, sure. the axiom I'm sticking to. I, uh... And I'm guilty of that too, like what you said, Ryan, of playing an MMO for a couple of days, and be like, no, this is great. It's you know, it's a premium product that does this, this, and this differently. And then a week or two in, I'm like, Wow, does this better? Wow, does this better? Wow, does this better? Wow, I'm like, is, so I just keep comparing it to World of Warcraft. I have to go, why don't I just go play Wow? And then I cut the subscription. And either I'll go back to Wow for a week and then be like, I'm bored, or I'll just not play anything ever again. I was Wildstar was the biggest example of that. I was like, this is great. This is great. Oh man, it's like Burning Crusade World of Warcraft. I miss those days. Yeah. And then I'm like, and eh, WoW does this better. WoW does this better. Oh, it's just like WoW in this aspect, but WoW's had eleven years to perfect this particular formula. And then I just I walk away from the MMO. It took me like three games to realize that was gonna be the result every time I tried a new one, so I just don't even bother at all now. I didn't. I kept trying. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel like MMOs as we've known them in the past as this huge force in the industry are kind of dead with the exception of wow the perception right now being that it's waning a little bit yeah. but like you remember like that was the game everybody wanted to make we made fun of it like a couple of years ago 
like everybody was making a MOBA. Now that people knew yeah. about Dota and League of Legends, like we're gonna make a Daisy or not a Daisy, a zombie MOBA, a Dead Island MOBA. That's what yep. I mean. We're gonna make a DC MOBA. We're gonna make a Lord of the Rings MOBA. Like that's what it felt like from like 2005 yeah. to 2011. Was like mm -hmm. we're gonna make this game as a MOBA because it prints money, man. Yeah. How could you <laughs> fail? And then they all failed. <laughs> yeah, and some awful. of them took like five years to develop. And I think now. You know, after Defiance and the Elder Scrolls Online and the Old Republic and Terra and Rift, et cetera, et cetera, I hope that most studios are going, most publishers, I guess, are going, we're not going to finance, like, another MMO. Right. Because it, it seems like I can't imagine a worse business decision of, like, a game that costs an extraordinary amount of resources to make and then has historically not returned with, and like, And not only one, that, but it costs exception. a lot all the time. Like, it continues <laughs> to cost a lot of money after you've exactly. made it. There's not a yeah. lot of games that do that. I feel like the only MMOs that are succeeding nowadays are the ones that are doing something drastically different. The reason you know yeah. uh, you got Eve Online is 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 so successful is because it's a it's 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 hard to call Eve Online an M it's an MMO sure but it's more like a it's like a sandbox game because it's it's com the the what I love about Eve Online why if I had time I'd probably be completely into that game is the developers are a hundred percent hands off they created the world and they said go. And the players create the rules, the laws. They're like sections of space that are completely controlled by this group of players and another group of players trying to take over in these huge wars. And that's what you read about all the time, are these huge like two or three day wars of players just trying to destroy another group of players to take over this section of space mm -hmm. because there's something there. Um, and like Destiny is a totally different game because it's a first person shooter. It's not really like this open world-ish type of game. Isn't it more of Destiny, more zone control? Yeah, it's, mm. it's small areas, and then there's a hub world. It's right. kind of like the Nexus in Demon Souls or something, and you just go off to an area and then mess around. Final with Fantasy it. 14 is the closest thing to WoW that's very successful, but it does enough different, in my opinion, and that's why it's doing really well. Um, but any other MMO that comes out that is trying to be WoW, and you've already listed a ton of yeah. them, uh, flop, because you will always look at it and compare it to World of Warcraft and go... WoW does it better. Well, yeah. The publishers all thought, like, hey, even if we just do the same shit as WoW, if we bring our IP to this, we'll be successful because we know our IP is amazing. So it's like Star Wars tried it, fucking Lord of the Rings tried it. You go yeah. on down the list. They yeah. found out eventually, even Elder Scrolls, like, we can't just make this based on our name alone. Yep. How crazy is that? That, like, Final Fantasy made it work. All it took was, you know, 30 years of goodwill and fairly <laughs> consistent positive releases, one of the most beloved franchises of all time. Yeah. And then, like, releasing it, having people hate it, put it back in development for three years, and then come out with it again, coinciding <laughs> with the release of a major new console. It was, mm. it was a... It, the, the Final Fantasy XIV before and the one out now are in, they're totally different games from the ground up. Yeah. Totally different. Regarding EVE Online, too, is my favorite old adage of... Uh, EVE Online is the most interesting game that I never want to play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a war fortress for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just becomes just like a series of Excel spreadsheets at some point. And like, yeah, you see all these Kinda. epic battles. That's the highlight reel. But really, like, there was 14 hours of planning and economic oh, yeah. distribution. That <laughs> when I was fight. specialist working all night just yeah. to figure out. The yeah, well, I, w when I, I remember talking to the developers when I was in Iceland. Uh, one of the cool things Paradox did for me and the guy I was stuck there with was set up a, an office tour of CCP and to see their, like, talk to the developers and hang out with them. And that was the thing I actually, we discussed is, like, 90% of EVE is the planning, is the, ga the resource gathering, is the building of the empire. The exciting 10% that the world sees is this, the, the, the wars and stuff. And, like, 90% is that boring shit that people do, but it makes that 10% so much more thrilling and adrenaline rush because you could lose Everything you invested you so much into that yeah. moment, and then it all just goes up in a blazing ball of fury. <laughs> those Titan ships that you see, those big ones, take real life like one or two months to build. Yeah, they're, wow. they're worth a tremendous amount of, amount money, of money, too, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Just like they not are. even the in game currency. So if you see money. like a like a company or they called corporations guild bring out a Titan, that's when you know shit is real. <laughs> like that is <laughs> that is a lot to risk right there. But a Titan can take on hundreds of little ships without any problem. Mm -hmm. 
So they need to like sign a charter to get the uh, corporation to release the Titan to go right. into the battle. So there's yeah, like people yeah. actually allowing these actions yep, to take place. Man, every fucking time I hear about this shit, I'm like, I want to play this game. This right, sounds awesome. Exactly. And then I load it up and I'm like, oh, this, oh is, my God. Oh, <laughs> this isn't for me at all. And like when those wars <laughs> happen, the fact that the CCP has devs at their computers 24 7 to monitor the servers to make sure the servers don't crash so that they can handle the thousands of players that are in this one section of space. They have something called yeah. time dilation where they slow everything down they do. for the battle and everything. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. There's some people wow. that are just, like, that's their whole life is Eve. They can make real life money off of it. Yeah, it's Imagine almost their all job. that shit was going down, and then the the server just broke. Like, how mad would they be? Like <laughs> yeah. that was five months of my life. <laughs> uh, we nuts. get worried about Twitch going down, man. They're yeah. they're losing five thousand dollars a minute every second that server's up. <laughs> Listen, I thought there was some story that like. Eve represents like two percent of Iceland's total GDP or something like that. They are, they are. Uh, I was being told by them that like, and if you ever go out with drinks of, with any of the CCP guys, and they know the CCP, you'll just get free drinks the whole night. Wow. Their building is gorgeous. It's huge. It's like six <laughs> or seven stories, and it's all like just for CCP. It's amazing. It's really cool. That is awesome. They're the oh. pride of Iceland, man. I, uh, god damn it, I gotta play Eve. I want to try. I got past the really rough part, and I was getting really into it. But then I was I was not doing any work, yeah. so then I had to stop. People, please tweet at me and tell me not to play Eve. Well, you'll get, you, dude. You'll get bored of it real quick because yeah. it's just time. hard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's also true. Yeah, half a percent. Still, half though, that percent. is it's huge. That yeah, is it's massive for an entire country. Yeah, that's ridiculous. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, World of Warcraft is. Very much still going to be a strong player, we think, for a long ways to come. Let us know what you think. Uh, subreddit is also a roundtablepodcast.reddit.com. <laughs> start up a thread over there. We'll always be hanging around there discussing stuff. So, all Age of Conan, all that. though, probably coming back real soon. Yeah? They it's had so, it on the Big Bang so, Theory, man. It's a wow killer. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I was so excited for Age of Conan. Oh, me too, man. I played through it, I'm like, I'm the chosen one. And then you're done with the tutorial, and you're like, oh, there's like 7,000 other chosen ones near me, all with the handprint on their chest. That's when you got to kill all the other chosen ones, make yourself. There can only be one. Yep. Yeah. All right, getting into our uh, games for this episode, we want to talk about Action Hank. Mm -hmm. Hank. Hank. I can't, Hank. I can't not say Hank. Because they're pronounced the same the way. way. Your jaw tenses up when you do yeah. it. We, we don't have like a letter that, like a sound in the English language that makes the name make sense. Yeah. Like, if they call them, like, Action Hink or something. Yeah, that, or Action Hunk. Easy. Ooh, there much better. Oh, 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 that would oh, be, that. like, ironic because he's got a big old beer gut. Was yeah. there something unattractive about that? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Action Hank uh, was released on May 11th to the tune of very positive reviews on Steam. Currently thirteen forty nine on sale. Regular price, 15 bucks. Uh, I, I am really enjoying Action Hank, actually, much more than I expected I would when I booted it up. It is sort of a, a Trials-like game, so yeah. if you guys have ever played Trials Evolution or Fusion or something like that, think of that, but you're controlling a big fat dude. He's running around. Bit Trip Runner is also figure. an apt comparison, uh, mm -hmm. I would say. Yep. There's a little Bit Trip. I also think that it, it mines a lot from Track Mania. In that, unlike yeah, yeah. Trials, there's, like, no levels that are nearly impossible to beat. Mm -hmm. But it's all about just, be, like, iterating on them and beating them as quickly as you can. Shaving yeah. off, like, a tenth of a second over and over. And the multiplayer yeah. is exactly the same as Trackmania. Mm -hmm. Which I like. I like the, uh, the way the multiplayer works. I think it's much better than just, like, pitting four people against each other in the same track and seeing who can get through the fastest. Because the tracks usually only take like 30 to 45 seconds to complete. At most, yeah. It's, but yeah, like that's the higher end of it. Some of them are as low as like 20 seconds. Uh, I also had to make sure I was .2 seconds ahead of Ryan on the overall leaderboards of the game before we started the show. Do it, man, I, I recorded <laughs> when I was ahead of you. That's the only thing that matters. It's oh, that's bullshit. Now. I'm going to have to... I have video evidence. I've got images. One day. <laughs> Well, we'll complete all the levels, and then we'll see who's on top. But anyway, so uh, it's it's got, like, these action figures from the 90s that you play as. That's kind of the appeal to it. I really like the way that the levels look and feel, yeah. too. So you're going through it, and you're sort of racing on almost, you know, like, race car track 
plastic like blocks slides and, and stuff. stuff and yeah, toys. just like all, all the old together. all the old classic toys that kids would play with in the '90s. And the rooms look so cool too. It's just like it's got all those different vibes to them. Like some of our, you know, disco party rooms, and then some of them are classic with the toy box in one corner and there's a little tube TV in the other. But it works really well with the aesthetic because it allows you to kind of see the rest of the level going around in a loop. It's on a 2D plane, but you can see sort of like... like on a cylinder kind of Yeah, turns yeah. In the future, yeah. like you can tell what's going to be happening later on down the stage. But well, I think uh, the biggest appeal to me is that it does control really well. I, I think the... Very uh, yes. yeah, It's very fluid. It's very responsive. You can... It's tricky to learn a lot of the quote unquote advanced tactics of the game, but that was like the laziest quote unquote I've ever done. Hit both fingers individually, kind of there. Quote, like, quote. quote unquote. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, I've been having a really good time with it, and I think it uh, does everything it wants to do quite well. Yeah, I've been having fun with it. Um, I remember looking at it way back when uh, the early build, or was it early access that it came out on? Mm. And saying I really think it's going to be fun because it was already pretty replayable at that point in time. Um, I get frustrated with those games though because unless I'm perfecting the stage, I'm not going to stop playing that stage. So mm. I don't I don't make a lot of progress very quickly. It's Yet fun. you are behind us in I every beat, single stage you've played I, this far. I, I, yeah, no, even I beat, me too. Actually, I just played some this morning and I beat you too. Nick didn't even I beat try you, uh, and kick your ass. I beat you. I beat you, motherfuckers. Today I would go back. Yes? I took first place off uh -oh. you guys. Right. Some of the grappling hook levels. Friendly rivalry is always good. Yeah, uh, but it's fun. I like it. It's it's like you said, Bear. It's, it's responsive. It's fluid. The imagination is really cool. I like being able to jump over big pits and see the floor becoming lava, which gives yeah. you the imagination that you're a kid playing with this toys. It's really fun. Mm -hmm. There's not much when to say. Yeah, it's a uh, level editor, level hub. Yeah, yeah. I will never use a level editor. I will. I, this is one of the games that may kind of... I'm probably not going to use it either, I'll be honest, but I'm thinking <laughs> about it, which is higher up in the tier <laughs> list than a lot of the other ones I've played. Yeah. I think it's really good. Um, like you guys said, it, I, I really like the levels are short. So, you know, uh, part of the, not problem, but part of the frustration in a trials game is when you get to those tracks that are like two minutes long. And if you make one mistake, you have to go back to the start. Yes. And then 20 tries might take you a half hour. Action Hank is a little faster than that, which is nice. You know, it's not as frustrating. Um, I kind of, I like that it doesn't have any super puzzly levels. Like there's very few times where you're like, I can't beat this level. It's usually like, I can't figure out how to get up to that high track, which means I can't set a great time. Yeah. But you're never actually like inhibited in your progress. Yeah. That being said, I think I'll, I'll be a dissenting opinion and say that I don't think the game looks particularly good. Like no? for me, at least like the art design and stuff like that and the references to action figures and that kind of culture from the 80s and 90s I think is really cool and inspired, but I think it kind of looks like a PS2 game. That's probably well, not. Fair. I wouldn't I can, go that far, but I can see where you're. It looks like from. a Unity game, but yeah. I think that's. But I think that's why I think it looks good because I think plastic action figures fit that really plasticky look that a lot of Unity games have. You think they did that on purpose? Uh, they were I trying to make something like really high but... def. And they ended up with these blocky characters. Like, <laughs> fuck it, let's just go with the '90s action figure style. The only dissonance that I think I feel is going with the fact that we're dealing with action figures and toys, but yet the movement feels super fluid and organic, where, you know, looking at that character, you would think, hey, this will probably feel stiff, and it yeah. doesn't. So I'm glad that it doesn't feel stiff, and in fact, I love the controls. They feel fantastic, but maybe it does feel a little bit off given what you're looking at. You think that's anything? Yeah. yeah. I, was... I don't know. For me, it's not, it's not like that dissonance. I just think that the, the textures don't look that good, which is normally something that I don't get that you know, bunged mm -hmm. up about, but I was playing at 1920 by 1080 and I was like, it looks a little blown out. Like it doesn't look bad necessarily. And it, it is charming with its direction, but I don't know. I, I don't think yeah, it looks it didn't register I, for me. What I'm comparing it to is track mania and, and trials. Cause I think those are the closest analogs or bit trip runner. And I think all those games have like a particular style. And in particular, the scope also is, is larger, except in Bit Trip. But Bit Trip's got its own kind of minimalistic, stylish thing going on, which is cool. But, like, both Trials and Track Mania have this kind of sprawling focus mm -hmm. or scope on each level. Like, Trials Fusion, there's all sorts of shit going on in the background. Whether you like Trials Fusion or not, you know, the, the levels are actually really impressive in the way that they look. And Action Hank is kind of like a cut below, I think, there. 
There's and stuff in the background too, actually. In this. There is, but it's it's less impressive. And like mm-hmm. it's kind of just like, oh, there's a reference to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. There's the sticker with the Unity logo and stuff like that. Like there, it, there's cool references and stuff like that. But Trials has like some crazy shit happening in the background. It's you know, like, like an the, alien invasion going exactly. on exactly behind you. And uh, the other thing is, I think. And I still really like Action Hank, but if you're comparing it to Trials, I think the physics feel floaty, and, like, I, I never really have a sense for how much my character weighs. Like, when I play Trials, right. I, like, I can feel the bike. In this, I'm kind of like, I don't know. I don't really feel I get like what you mean. a dude. It's, it, it feels like, it, it's very hard to describe, but it, it's not as satisfying, it's not as weighty as something like, you know, like the bike in Trials, but it's still a good game. With what Nick said, too, it's interesting that uh, you're playing with a character like Hank who has a big old belly. Mm. And I find it's actually like I tried to switch characters a couple of times and I can't do nearly as well with the skinnier (laughs) characters as I can with Hank, which is so bizarre that like I've I've associated this level of mobility with the fattest character in the game. (laughs) It's like playing as Rufus in Street Fighter. It was like, yeah, he should be doing this. This this man does not belong in these positions, but I suppose I'll I'll learn to live with it. (laughs) It's a great quote. Mm -hmm. This man does not belong. Yeah, take that out of context a few times. (laughs) The Uh, way the ghost system works is is really motivating as well. Like, the only complaint I have about the ghost system, I'll, I'll... explain it very quickly. Basically, on each level there's thresholds to get a certain caliber of metal, bronze, silver, gold, and rainbow, which is like super tough. But um, you get a ghost that uh, sets like the baseline time, and if you beat that ghost you get the metal, basically. So you can see the mistakes that you make relative to what they're doing. You can also race against all your friends' ghosts, and they download in like less than a second. So it, it's super easy to see like, oh, that's where he's gaining like a half second on me here and, and do that. And that's a really like good motivating factor. Mm-hmm. I just wish they showed them like right at the start because when you're like super close together, sometimes someone will just get in front of me, but I won't have seen what they've done, and I'm like, ah, yeah. How you, are you have doing to that? you have to hold back for like half a second at the beginning so you can stay right behind them to see. That what makes it is sense. That That's to but, learn. Yeah. Yeah, but the uh, yeah they also have the leaderboards that allow you to download the replays of anyone on the leaderboards. So you can yeah, watch yeah. the number one guy who is this guy named Quartzy for mm. pretty much every level. <laughs> they even have a little message built into the loading screens on the game that says his course he's still in first place. And I saw that, actually. Yes, he is. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's cool. They've got a lot of really good uh, leaderboard functionality and all that stuff. They, they Everything that you could expect out of a game like this, they do and they do well. So yep. with that to its, its credit, it's pretty... Mm-hmm. It is, yeah. It's fun. I think Early Access did them well for this one, too. I think they learned a lot from the Early Access release of the game. They put out a uh, very polished product, so yeah. We all, uh, yeah, Ryan hates it, but we all think it's I, great. I like it a lot. <laughs> Good job, I like Ryan. it a lot, but I will say that it's it's weird because my baseline for this is exclusively, like, games that are the same price published with a huge amount of resources behind them. Right, yeah. yeah. Like, mm-hmm. if, if your baseline is Trials, I wouldn't say you'd be disappointed, but there are some things where I'm like, ah, oh, Trials does this a little bit better. Trials is a little bit more, you know, refined in this area. It's still really good, but... If you're coming from that baseline, and that's not a reason not to get it if you're interested. In fact, if you like the Trials games, I would recommend this more because it's something like it's a style of gameplay that you're going to be, you know, automatically kind of able to understand it and enjoy. Mm. But I don't think it necessarily beats the, the Trials games. That's just my piece on that. Yeah, that's fair. Except uh, maybe Trials Fusion. Oh, come on. I love <laughs> Trials Fusion. It's the worst. Well, it's not the worst one. It's worse than Evolution. Maybe. Maybe. I want to fight you on that, but okay. Fifteen dollars uh released available now out of early access action hank. We'll have a link down below. At least I will. I'll give it to him too, so yeah, we'll have it. Next on the agenda, today is Invisible Ink. It's the new one by Clay. This one was in early access as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, it like came a year out. and a half, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's been around for a little while. Finally out, uh the full release now available on Steam, currently ten percent off. Normal price twenty dollars. It's now eighteen. Came out on May twelfth out of early access. It's got the clay art style for sure. Well, maybe a little bit different actually for this one. I think they uh, well they didn't break out of their shell, but it's you know it's a, a bit more humanized. I think that for this it's iteration, like, it's, it's stylized two D art. It's yeah. it doesn't look like a Tim Burton movie like Don't Starve does. It doesn't mm-hmm. really look like Mark and the Ninja, but it does. It's definitely you know 
clay. You can look at that and you can think clay. That it doesn't look like shank, but yeah. it looks shankish. Sh it's a shank like like. <laughs> shank like like. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't. I'm curious to hear what you guys think about it because the last time I didn't, I haven't really played the full release, but I did play it back when I got an early access code a while ago. I did a video on it, mm. um, and I was very mediocre on it at the time. I didn't like a lot of the mechanics they had playing, and I remember getting into a discussion with. One of the developers on Twitter about what I didn't like, why I didn't like it, why he was defending certain points, but we didn't argue. It was just like a, it was a very civil discussion. And I'm excited to go back to see if they've changed a lot of that or if I would still be like, eh, it's, it's okay. You should also talk when, about what it is, first of all. When did you play it also? I'll look up the video right now. Well, you talk about what it is while I look up my video. Mm -hmm. All right. Invisible Ink is uh, it's a stealth-based, squad-based tactics game or strategy game, the easiest way to describe it in terms of stuff that already exists is that it's a, a little bit more of a stealth focus, well, a lot more of a stealth focused XCOM. So in every mission, instead of your objective being, we're going to kill all the enemies on the other side, usually your objective is like infiltrate a building, steal something, and then get out. So every level you, f you find an objective, you hack it basically, and then you get to a teleporter that allows you to escape. So instead of engaging enemies, which you can do, usually your best course of action is to, you know, engage in kind of subterfuge and stuff like that. Like a little like dishonority in a way. But it's isometric mm -hmm. and, and 2D like XCOM. What so is interesting to note, I think uh, with anything beyond the easiest difficulty setting is kind of permadeath, isn't it, to a degree? Not really permadeath, but your actions are permanent. The, it, is, it, it is permadeath to some extent. Mm -hmm. When a unit gets uh, knocked out in combat, you can resurrect them, which is very difficult. Because you only start with two uh, agents at the start. You can get more throughout depending on the missions that you choose. You could break like another agent out of prison uh, in one of the mission types. Uh, or you can actually just drag their body to the teleporter and then they'll come back with you. But those are both very difficult to do. Sometimes it's just better to leave them behind. But I, I don't know if I would say that... Like it doesn't have branching paths, really. Yeah. But it does, it does have permadeath for the agents. All right, when did I, you play uh, it, Mathis? Eight, eight months ago. Okay. Oh, okay. So that um, was actually very recently... Um, it, so that was like when when it came out in in beta, which was around yeah. like August and I remember 2014. One, I mean, it's been a while, so I mean, I'm a little bit fuzzy on some of the mechanics, but I remember not liking the alarm system very much. Um, I remember it being a little bit too punishing for some of the things I was doing. Um, and I'm I'm not sure. Like, does the alarm system still there? Can Can you actually re-explain the alarm system how it works now and see if okay. that's the alarm system is is basically a central conceit of the game. So yeah. like that that's that is not gone anywhere. Basically, the, the alarm system works on kind of like a radial gauge. Level thing, yeah. yeah. And it starts at level one, well, level zero, and then every turn that you do, uh, the alarm ticks up by one. And when it reaches the end, it goes up to the next level. So on alarm level zero, there's no punishment. On alarm level one, it's kind of like, you know, go faster because there's going to be punishment soon. Then 10 turns in, you get to alarm system two and like more enemy cameras activate. Alarm system. That's what I hated about it. Yeah, I remember it, it, the the alarm system went up with whether or not you made mistakes or not. It would just go up, right? Yeah, because the the way that they frame that, and it's something that they've done a really good job of with uh, with the actual release versus the beta releases. Finally, they have like a narrative wrapping for why any of this stuff is going on, why you okay. only have seventy two hours to do what you need to do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is that like they they've encountered or they they detected that there's been like an anomaly in their system, and they're like getting more suspicious as time goes on. Okay. So yeah, yeah. That, that still exists, and that is an interesting part of the gameplay because you have to balance like a, a secondary objective in like every mission is do you want to hack all the stuff that you can to get like as much money as possible to outfit your agents after you leave the mission, or like you might get company secrets that give you more missions in the future. But the longer you spend doing your due diligence there, the more the alarms go up and the harder it's going to be for you to get out. So you have to balance this like you know speed versus kind of like scope of the yeah. mission. I remember that was, now that we're talking about it, I remember that was like kind of the crux of my complaint of the alarm system was it wasn't necessarily that I hated the alarm system. I didn't mm. like that the alarm system happened if you were playing perfectly. I feel like a lot of the, the, the kind of the concept behind the game is being stealthy, is this, you know, being secretive thing. And if I'm playing through a level very intelligently, not being seen or whatever, I, I felt like the alarm system shouldn't necessarily be going up. But if a guard saw me, instead of giving me a tick of an alarm, drop, bump it up a level immediately. But don't punish me 
for playing strategically and slow paced, I guess, quote unquote, because it's a stealth game that's based around strategy. So if I'm playing quietly and not being seen, I felt like the game was like bad. You shouldn't be doing smack my mic. Bad. You shouldn't be doing smacks it right in the microphone. Uh, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be playing slow and stealthy. You should be going trying to make quick decisions and stuff. Um, maybe make the alarm system go up a tick if you decide to hack something. Maybe make that go up a bar. Instead of being every turn, you better hurry up, you're going too slow. That bothered me, and I remember that being you're a You're too slow! <laughs> I don't, I don't want to fall back <laughs> on the Apotheon thing, because with Apotheon, we were like, it would be better if it had this kind of combat, and the developer was like, well, that would be a different kind of game. But I do find myself kind of wanting to be like, I, I think there's a case to be made that a game like that could be good. That like when you get seen, there like there's no continuous consequences, but when something you make a mistake, there's a huge consequence. Right, like it goes up one level. I could see that, and I'm actually I loaded up Steam here because I want to start Invisible Ink to see if maybe that's a custom option because there's a like XCOM Enemy Unknown. There's a lot of uh, custom campaigns like uh, modifiers yeah. and stuff you can turn on. So I'll check on that. Yeah, I'm that was fine. that was the thing I was to talking to the dev over Twitter a lot about. Now that you've jogged my memory, that was like my biggest gripe. And he was like, well, this is the reason we're doing it. And I was like, yeah, but here's why I don't think it's a good idea. Um, and then you know, it wasn't, again, it wasn't an argument. It wasn't like the, uh, an, like an argument problem. In a way, I kind of feel like, and this, I don't mean this to sound dismissive to you, but I think it's kind of like an intellectual, like immersion breaking thing. Yeah, I think, like, as a game, the mechanics work really well, from my perspective, at least. Mm -hmm. But I agree that it, it sort of doesn't make intuitive sense that if this, like, if you don't do anything wrong, people notice you still. But they don't, yeah. I mean, you can still work around it and be, like, totally ghosty. And the, the conceit that they give for it is that they, you basically teleport into their building. So, like, they saw some kind of like energy anomaly but it's all arbitrary either way yeah, that's you know like they <laughs> they could say like they didn't detect an, an energy anomaly or they could say yeah. you know whatever um okay I'll, i'm gonna see i'm on here alarm when guards ko alarm multiplier so you can turn the multiplier on the alarm up but i don't think you can actually change you when... can make your problem worse mathis if that's <laughs> what you're interested in <laughs> yes you can make the alarm easier oh no you know what there is an auto increment alarm you could turn it off turning this off will still allow the alarm to increase but it will only move when it is triggered by some event such as a guard being killed or an agent being discovered by a camera hey, there, you, there go. you go pretty much exactly what you asked for but you probably have to fuck with the other multipliers or yeah, modifiers i would, would, would want to be punished harder for fucking up yeah as opposed to be incrementally punished for not doing anything hmm. like you get there seen you by a guard you knock a guard out bam immediate level up or whatever um as opposed to be like incremental, but I'm glad they actually put that in there. That's cool. I'm, I'm, that allows you to play how I want. That's probably how I will end up playing. That allows you to play how Mathis <laughs> wants, which is what, <laughs> what we all want, surely. Right. Exactly. I'm trying to think of other turn-based stealth games that we could compare this to. I'm, I'm drawing a blank in that genre. Uh, I haven't played it, but is there something like, uh, like stealthy in Shadowrun? I always got the vibe from it that Shadowrun is. Yeah, uh, it's got. <sighs> I wouldn't I even really RPG. put them in the same ballpark, honestly. Like, I think there are... I recall playing a couple of kind of stealthy parts of Shadowrun, but it wasn't, you know, like a... This is a game based around stealthily moving around and not being spotted sort of deal. But Shadowrun definitely Syndicate? is a... What was that? The old Syndicate, maybe? Didn't play that. Assassin's Creed Syndicate? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's Can't the wait. old Syndicate. Yeah, the old oh. Syndicate. No, the, new one now. the reboot now. What was, uh, what was Syndicate? Old. It was like an old corporate espionage game that got a pretty big following uh, over the years, and eventually that's when they rebooted it into a uh, you know first -person gritty first-person shooter. shooter, of course. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I think Syndicate has been listed as an inspiration for Invisible mm -hmm. Ink, but I haven't played it myself, so... That's where I saw the parallel. Hey, this is something cool that uh, I didn't know, actually. All Mark of the Ninja owners get a 20% discount on... Uh, yeah, Invisible. look at on that. That's cool. Um, so... I really like Invisible Ink, and I played probably like, well, I won't, you know, come up with a guess. I'll just look here when my Steam library actually loads. But uh, I played probably five or six hours of it uh, in its beta version last August, and I really liked it then, but it was missing, like, the things that tied it together to make it a game that was good, basically. It was, it was a sandbox for mechanics, which was cool. Um, but now that those mechanics are kind of overlaid with the narrative and there's more of a progression system in the campaign, I really, really like it. And it, I'm going to, I'm intending on playing 
like the campaign multiple times through because it is the thing it has over or different from something like XCOM Enemy Unknown is that the campaign is seriously only maybe four hours long, five hours yeah. long. Right. So mm-hmm. in a way, it's almost like you know what what Isaac does to a traditional RPG that expedited kind of progression through it and it cuts all the the fat basically and is just all about that meat. It, it's kind of like that and. Uh, I, I beat it on beginner, and it was it was tense, but relatively easy. And now I'm going back on experience, which is like the intermediate level difficulty, and it's much much harder. But it's it's a lot of fun. I would really really recommend it, and it it really does scratch that kind of like splinter cell niche. Like Mathis was saying, it sucks that the game kind of rushes you, but in a way, I don't feel like in the gameplay that manifests itself as being like I'm gonna run out in front of this guard, or I'm just like gonna run up and and tase him. Hmm. Instead of taking the time to sneak around, usually what it what ends up happening is you make the decisions with trade-offs for do I want to stay and hack all this stuff to get a ton of credits to make my next mission easier, or do I just want to get to the exit because if I stay too long, like the danger is going to come, like, it's it's going to mount too much. Danger zone. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I I really like it. I mean, on default settings, but I I agree with Mattis. It's cool that they have the the ability to modify the gameplay like that. And it scratches that Splinter Cell itch when you, like, make a plan and you actually execute it without being seen and you get out. It's, like, it's really satisfying. You're, like, I outsmarted the enemies. Mm-hmm. I'm rambling here, but also I like that it's, like, Mark of the Ninja where it's a stealth game, but none of the mechanics are obfuscated. It's, it's really, really clear. Like, when you look at a camera, you see on the tiles on the ground where the camera can see. Mm-hmm. So in something like XCOM, you're like, okay, I'm going to take... And I love XCOM, but you know, you're like, I'm going to take a unit and run it out into the open and hope that this alien over here won't, it won't be within their field of vision. Uh, Invisible Ink doesn't work like that. You really can look at it and make a plan and be like, okay, the camera will see here, but there's blind spots around it, so I can sneak like blind spot to blind spot and get around. And then this guard takes a patrol pattern through here, so when he walks by, I'll move to this blind spot, and then I can actually sneak out without him knowing that I'm there. It, it's cool. It, it's like Mark of the Ninja in that it's very easy to see how elements will interact with one another and then yeah. make a plan that works on, on that. I'm pretty damn impressed just overall. I just started thinking about this. Clay's track record, they've got a pretty eclectic range of games that they put out now. They've got yeah. Mark of the Ninja, the 2D side-scrolling ninja stealth action game. They've got Shank, which is obviously crazy in and of itself they've got uh don't starve which is totally different from either of those two and then they've now got invisible ink which as i just mentioned is a genre that i don't think is really occupied by many other games at all and they're doing really well with all of them so yeah that's quite impressive for just a single developer but uh yeah invisible ink is uh, I, I like it as well i haven't played nearly as much uh but i i'm looking forward actually to playing a lot more i think it's going to be a really good time What's but. also cool about Invisible Ink <laughs> <laughs> is that you have your choice of missions at all times, and there's a, like uh, there's like four or five different kinds of missions based on the companies that you're kind of like stealing from. Mm-hmm. So there's like a security company, and uh, like a an administrative company, and then like a prison company. And when you go to a mission that is overseen by the security company, like, the enemies are different. They're going to be, like, heavily armored units. And then there's a, like, biotechnology company. When you go there, there's going to be, like, augmented units. So, like, the the soldiers might have built-in heart rate monitors or something. So if you knock them out, then it raises the alarm level. And then the cybernetics company is more likely to have, like, robotic drones. The drones are, like, you can't knock them out at least not with the weapons you start with, but you can actually hack them and then use the drones to, like, scout throughout the level, and it, they might be outfitted with, like, an assault rifle you can actually use to murder the other guards on the level. So it's got kind of like a like a Deus Ex, like, original Deus Ex thing where you can kind of, like, hack into these security systems and, and use them against your enemies, which is really cool. And based on the company, you get different rewards. So some missions are, like, money-focused. You get a lot of money. Some are like prison breakouts, and if you break someone out, they join your squad, so you'll have three people instead of two. Some of them are like, uh, for like the biotechnology company, you might find like a special augment that you can install on one of your agents that maybe allows them to move like twice as much or something like that. So it's really like in the campaign, part of the strategy is mission selection. It's not just like doing the mission, but selecting properly for like what you need, as opposed to just like, this. I have to do an alien abduction right now. I have to do, you know, a UFO crash mission right now. 
And this is not to say that it's, it's better than XCOM Enemy Unknown, which is a fantastic game, but rather just different meaningful design decisions. So you're not, what was, like, tri, like Trials versus, versus Action Hank, to some extent I'm like, I like this, but it's a slightly worse Trials. Invisible Link is different enough from XCOM that I don't really get that feeling when I'm playing it. Well, that's it. not fair. Trials is a game about a motorcycle. Action Hank is a platformer with a dude. You can't compare that like that. <laughs> <laughs> It's not it's so say. crazy. It's about weight shifting on trials. You don't do any weight <laughs> shifting. It's about sliding on your butt. Look, I understand that those seem like relatively minor divergences. They're big but for, for a strategy game uh, like this that you might invest a lot of time in. And, you know, it, it's my personal opinion on it. I don't, when I play man. Action Hank, I don't think it's a worse trials. But I do. That's all I thought. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still good. Action Hank is still good. Mm hmm. And so is Invisible Ink. So is, clearly, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think you really like that one, huh? <laughs> I like it a lot. I think it's it, it's one of those games, like Titan Souls, where I'm like, this is a game that is not only fun, but, like, really well designed. And it's easy to see, like, the design in the game. Right. Word. Invisible Ink, 20 bucks. Available on Steam today. Woo! Right now, you can buy it with money. Yay! Hooray! Or Speaking cards, of money. You trade them. You can give us some money, patreon.com slash roundtable. We're going to thank those supporters in a minute because I haven't forgotten. Before we do that, it's time for Nick's Weird Games. Oh, I did think you forgot, actually. I'm brought to you, you by didn't. the sultry sounds of the uh, Wombo Combo video. Oh, Happy yeah? Feed. Happy feed. Wombo Combo. There you go. Nick's Weird Games theme song. <laughs> I'd like to... Uh... Garfunkel and Oats? Oh, yeah, we can go for that. The fuck is Garfunkel and Oats? Simon right, and Garfunkel, not, maybe? Simon, yeah, and, Simon Garfunkel and Garfunkel and all yeah. the notes. <laughs> Wait, what, I, what is Garfunkel and notes, I don't know. Actually? I don't know why I said that, to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't know. I went with it, but then it clicked. And then, wait, no, that's... Yeah, Simon and Garfunkel, let's hear it. I'm going to no, 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 go with because I just had my wisdom seat taken out. I don't want to... Oh, see. man. Disappointed. I'm sorry. Garfunkel and notes is, is like a... Can you maybe Brand of, give us a substitute? No, no. You can give us a substitute. I don't know about... It's time for Nick's Weird Games. He's got some games to play. He brought them to his desk for us. A glorious day today. I like, really like it, but it was like a loot player. Brought to you at Simon radio. and Garfunkel kind Brought of. Brought to you by bit. Witcher Three. On I, I I got like a medieval bard vibe from that. <laughs> okay, yeah, me too. I can. I can now there's that. anything wrong with that. It was it was still impressive. I have to Beautiful. give the people what they want. If you're not going to give them to, sure. I appreciate it honestly. <laughs> All, All right. right, what do you got? Well, I'm curious if any of you guys have ever heard or have, or seen this one. This is called Savage Skies. No, I haven't. This is a science-based dragon MMO. <laughs> what? No. With realistic. It's, uh, it's kind of like a dog fighting game with dragons for the PS2. Is that an M oh, rating? Yeah, Panzer Dragoon? Uh, that is an that M is rating. That's a mature rating for, for Savage Skies. Blood Violence. By BAM. Published by BAM them. Entertainment. By BAM and Rock Interactive, or IROC? You can't yeah, tell. I you would pick them. BAM Entertainment is a dormant video game publisher that published such titles as Carmen Sandiego, The Secret of the Stolen Drums. Man, <laughs> they're that's dormant, a good so they're lineup. not they're not extinct. They're just napping. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be back one day with Savage Skies too. All right, so, what's Savage Skies then? The back says, "Do you have what it takes to control an eighty foot dragon without becoming lunch?" The skies darken with shadows from the wings of fantastic creatures locked in midair, claw to claw combat. Whoa. And the valleys fill with the sounds of warfare and strife as mythical beasts clash in armed conflict. Three factions compete for dominance in this strange land. The noble warriors of Vertwin. Yeah, the mutated hive mind of the Chrysalis <laughs> and the undead armies of Pariah. Fuck, He's dude, that's a lot of threats. <laughs> <laughs> and rule the kingdom. So there's 24 fantastical creatures from myth and legend. There's more than 60 weapons for riders and mounts alike. Over 25 battle campaigns. And you can discover the secrets of Savage Skies to unlock secret missions, hidden creatures, powerful weapons, and all new gameplay modes. Does this not make you want to play it? I kind of am interested. I've got two things right off the bat. One, yeah. uh, if you're an 80-foot dragon, I don't think becoming lunch is a concern. Two... They've got like the hive mind Hold of the chrysalis. What do you mean with that dragon the lunch? The trainer list? becomes the lunch. Oh, you're a trainer. You're not a dragon. You 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 ride the dragon like you always do. 
I thought, I thought you dragon. were. I thought you were the dragon. Sorry, no, I that's Panzer Dragoon Orta. Right, Point, no, you right. ride the dragon in Panzer Dragoon Orta as well, Bear. Oh. Also, you got Zerg in there, and you got Undead and Humans. So yeah. you got, like we got like Warcraft and and Starcraft just coming together for yeah, this crazy on the rail shooter. No, it's not on rails. It's actually you can kind of wander where you want. It's got big open sections of Shit. gameplay. There's like zeppelins and there's like. I don't know, storming some gates, blowing shit up. It's got a really great heavy metal soundtrack, which I really hope you guys can hear. And also, one of the worst introductions that I've ever seen. I definitely recommend that you Google uh, it's called Savage, Savage Skies. Skies. Yeah, uh, on YouTube. Go find the intro, because it's hilarious. And surprisingly, an no stage. Let's Plays. At an earlier stage in its development, Savage Skies had been set for release as Ozzy's Black Skies, complete with an endorsement from Black <laughs> Sabbath frontman Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> Nice. In, in the original concept, each of the three games playable factions would have been led by a different Aussie character. Oh no! The we game done also Kiss to versus feature Slash versus Ozzy. <laughs> music from Osborne, including Crazy Train and Paranoid. However, in late 2001, the tie-in was dropped for reasons including its high financial cost and misconceptions about the game that made it difficult to secure a publisher. <laughs> Bam Entertainment said, "Hold up, this Skies game is pretty sweet." But we don't want to associate with the Prince of Darkness, Ozzy Osbourne. Mm. If you want to publish under the BAM Entertainment label, <laughs> publisher of such high-octane titles as Carmen Sandiego, The Search for the Stolen Drums, <laughs> we've got to maintain a certain standard of purity and legitimacy. Hey, they've got four Dexter's Lab games under the belt, I have you know. <laughs> yeah. They've got a reputable lineup here. I'm watching think... the, uh, the opening to this game. you got to hear the wow. sound. The, the voices are so hilarious. This is... Fucking I guess I'm gonna have to throw this on at the end of the podcast video here. You gotta give me another task. Fucking, that's like I a think, pig dragon. What is happening? Oh, what they wanted. Oh, X versus Sever? The gate the GBA release of two thousand one published by oh. Bam Entertainment? Dude, that was a great movie. Yeah. Lucy Liu and Antonio Banderas. Oh, there's the gameplay. Eight minutes in. I think what they wanted was to position it as Twisted Metal with Dragons in the multiplayer. Mm. Which oh, I think is actually is an okay up, idea. They also made Reign of Fire, the video game. Oh, like, no. Don't just recycle the same <laughs> hardware from Savage Skies. <laughs> oh, man, this guy's riding like a giant bird. He's not even riding a dragon. Yeah, there's a lot of different mythical creatures, like I said. I think 24, in fact, and unlockables. Oh. And right, there's a well, lock-on mechanic. Even better. At the risk of being content ID matched by BAM Entertainment in their dormant state, I don't think I'll throw the actual trailer in the video here of the podcast, but I'll give you guys a link. There's demons. Give you guys the link down below. This is wild. This is a wild game. Who wouldn't want to yeah. play Savage Sky? Like Savage Entertainment Skies. published the A Sound of Thunder game, based on the movie, based on like the Ray Bradbury, the GBA short one, right? Story. Yeah, they they're like I played that. It's not bad. GBA. Nick, hmm. no. there's yeah. no let's play of this game. <laughs> Somebody needs to get on this. All right, it, I could be the one. There you go. Man. The game's criticism focused on the password-based save system and nice. praise on the single cart multiplayer. The single cart multiplayer. Single cart on a disc. Kotaku said, yo, I don't like this password-based <laughs> save system, but the single cart multiplayer is pretty impressive. <laughs> Thanks, Kotaku. Gave it a yes, conditionally. <laughs> that is Nick's Word Games, and this is the Roundtable Podcast, episode 8? I don't know, man. I don't. It's After like the first five, yeah, you start to oh, lose track. I think track. it's episode seven. Is it? I think so. Let's look at iTunes. Episode you can subscribe four. to us on iTunes. Also, give us a uh, a review and a rating. The reviews don't mean much, but the ratings certainly do help. So we appreciate any of those. Also, uh, this is episode no, seven. This All is right. definitely eight, man. I got I got seven here. Oh yeah, you're oh, totally shit. lying. I'm I'm lying. I'm <laughs> well, looking at the wrong. Way to be a Dumbo. Fucking big, big, head. fat, stupid, dumb head. Wow, you don't have to get personal. <laughs> uh, Twitter.com slash roundtablepc is where you can go to tweet at us. You can also go to roundtablepodcast.reddit.com for all the discussion about the episodes and all that. Uh, Patreon.com slash roundtable. We want to thank the patrons for this episode at the $5 tier and above. Even if you can just give us a buck a month, that is incredibly generous and helpful. We thank you very much for it. Patrons this episode include Max Pillen, Garrett Stewart, new member at the $75 tier, who I have to give some sultry tones of the uh, Wombo Cabo video to upon his request. 
Christopher Flagg, Casey, E.P. Diablo, Sweetheart, Kevin Walker. That's cute. Alexander Spillman, Jonathan Graham, Jeff Rush, Robert David Bradley, Matt, Julian Avelsgard, Hired Help, Caspian Crawdad, Kevin Berkland, Connor Littlewood, Rumble Muffin, Maximilian Messerschmidt, Sir Murphett, Logan Ray, Ignacio, A1 Base, David Terraoka, The Deacon, Mr. Scribe Monkey, Christopher Kuo, Will Van Der Kooi, uh, Hunter DeLacy, Brian, Brandon Bennett, Rhiannon, OIC Mudkip, Simon Iriala, Demius, Gibonis, Christopher Farmer, Garju, Batman9502, Kaj, Star Copper, Eroticals, Vandervet, first name, I don't know, Grace Card, Peter R., Thomas Cashman, Michael Gilbert, Unix, Sebastian Iorga, John Morrison, Michael Gray, Justin Positron, Brizzlebrip, Saint City Riot, Scott Cullen, Music of DP, Jesse Warburton, Chris Hauer, Jonathan Bloodworth, Hiro Alato, ZHXB, how would you say that phonetically? It's actually a CD project, Red. <laughs> Yakers, Jonathan Collins, Levi Robertson, Pile of Bunnies, Solon Carter, Modest Ponin, Dragon Slayer, Doppelganger. Still one of my favorite names to say. It just feels good so one. good coming out of your mouth. J. Kyle Pittman, Fred Durst, right, Michael Schwader, Andreas Deimbacher, Doylam, Suicide Prinny, Z Mod, Wolves at My Door, Tobias Dushpol. Eric Heinrichs, Dylan Kaij, uh, Tobias Klaus, Salty Onion, Chris Remockel, Grimbo, Andrew James Smith, Chris Bunch, Graham Alarton, Will Bailey, Duck Souls, a woohoo! He actually has that as part of his name, I had to say it. <laughs> it's in parentheses. Uh, Kelperter, Sam B, Christmas 95, Titan, Luke Chen, J.H., Paul, Nathan Wood, Rusty Hole, Chris Davies, Constantinos Cherdonis. Jose Estrada, Benjamin Mickelson, Jordan Yarandi Poor, Sebastian Morin, Barcelo, Cooper Williams, Marvin Peach, The Awakak, Julian W., Lucas Sidling, Dudok22, Jack McAteer, Jack Akar, Doug Rivet, Hammerschnitz, Tom Reese, Hugh Perry, and Big D Doc and Dude. Big D Doc and Dude. That is always... a nice list. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, yeah thank you. Really nice Woo! List. Thank you guys so much. We'll be live on twitch.tv slash roundtable podcast uh, this coming Tuesday, which is going to be the 19th, which is the day The Witcher comes out, so you know we'll not be playing that. So if you're looking for somebody to not be playing The Witcher on Twitch on that Tuesday, come hang out with us. Yes. Yep. I and might not be there because I might be playing The Witcher. We'll find you might not be there because you'll be asleep. Sleeping, yeah. Right. If and it's going to be anything, I can accept you sleeping, but you <laughs> ditching us to play The Witcher, you <laughs> son of a bitch. And I uh, think that's all. I think we got everything. We're good. We're good, right? All right. I have I'm to good. make sure because I, I've been Check known the list. To, I checked it twice. I then you're find good. find out who's not here nice. Santa Claus is coming next week. Oh, I wish. It's too fucking hot here. Next episode will be the uh, 29th of May. It'll be Let's episode record nine. that earlier. We will. Normal. Yeah, so get get ready for another out of date roundtable podcast. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> Hooray! All right. Woo! Thanks for watching, everybody. Thank Thanks for listening. Yeah. Yeah. Hi right, guys. You're all pretty good. This podcast is entirely supported by you, the listener. To consider supporting us as well as seeing the ways in which you can become a part of the show, visit patreon.com/slash roundtable. Woo!